Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Pylon Show. Uh, we just got done a wonderful little interview with Grant Davies. Uh, that was fantastic. Really great to kind of hear the inside word. Uh, and now we have Katz joining us. Katz, how are you doing today? I'm doing great then. How are you? I'm fantastic. A little bit jet lagged. I'm actually, these are my pajamas that you see me wearing right now. <laughs> and I have a hat on because I woke up and went directly to my computer. Um, but yeah. Uh, very still wearing the same shirt as well. So. I was going to say, I've been wearing <laughs> this shirt changed. for almost an entire week. It has not left my body. And at this point, it may very well be bonded to my skin. So I'm glad that we all have this in common. Yeah, we live an hour and a half apart and I can still smell it. All right. <laughs> um, let's quickly go over the sponsors of the Pylon Show and then a little roadmap of what we're going to be looking at here today. Uh, so first off, Matriano, matriano.com forward slash the Pylon Show. Our code this week, if you would like to contribute to the show, uh, is Pylon. Wait, no. Code this week is cookie. Sorry. It must be National National Cookie, cookie Week. There you go. What is your guys' favorite cookies? I'm a white chocolate macadamia nut kind of person. Uh, that's wrong. Sure, what about you, cats? Uh, that sounds decent, actually. Chocolate macadamia, isn't it one or the other usually? No, it's just white chocolate macadamia nut. Oh, it's just like a I classic see. cookie. Yeah. Uh, Either that or yeah, I'm, stick I'm not a huge on cookies. Really fancy. Um, but that, that sounds pretty good. What's what's well, what's that? The correct answer is oatmeal raisin. It is the greatest cookie. <laughs> That's um, the most boring dad cookie of them all. Like you have to is. go to bed by no later than 930 every night to like that cookie. I wish I could go to bed no later than 930, but GSL keeps me up later than that quite often, unfortunately. Uh, but guys, type in cookie on our Match Reno page uh, and you can help us out if you'd like some mugs and hoodies and whatnot. Definitely check that out there. National Cookie Month. That's kind of a funny month to have for National Cookie Month, considering on the last day of the month, you get so much candy. Okay. Uh, also, check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash The Pylon Show. Without your guys' support, The Pylon Show just would not exist. Uh, this is how we keep it funded. So thank you so much to everyone. Uh, we have all sorts of different tiers and rewards, including asking us questions at the end of the show, which always get answered. Uh, and we will be doing that, of course, at the end of the show, our Patreon questions. Of course, if you are a Patreon, you can check out thepylonshow.com. And you will have access to our forums, which are in beta right now. Eventually, they'll be released to the entire public. But right now, just for our Patreon subscribers. We also have uh, you know, all sorts of resources for the Pylon Show. Like if you need show notes, VODs, anything like that. You need to find out where you can download this on your phone to just listen to it or watch on YouTube or whatever. You need a countdown to when it's live. We've got all that there on the pylonshow.com. So definitely check that out. All right. <clears throat> so jumping into the show here, uh, we have quite a few uh, little talks to go over. Cats, I believe you have a couple things that you'd like to talk about here today uh, as far as some root news, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, uh, if we're yeah going into that, we just uh, announced that we are adding race and disc to our squad. They are very strong North American Protoss players, so we're mm -hmm. pretty happy with that. Almost our entire competitive roster is North American Protoss players now. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> race used to be a Terran, didn't he? He was, yeah. yeah um, so maybe the next and disc was also at some point a, a Terran player. He got GM with Terran too. So the Ooh. interview can be found on uh, Root for Root. That's her website, rootforroot.com. And it's pretty funny because it's two separate interviews, but the same questions apply. Um, so the second question is something like, you switched from Terran to Proto. So <laughs> 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 that's well, pretty good. Congratulations on that. Neeb did it first. I'm, not, I'm glad he has lots of disciples. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing to see uh, how many... Terran players over time just want to switch to Protoss. Even when everyone was going from StarCraft 1 to StarCraft 2, a lot of people were just like, you know what, I'm going to play Protoss because everyone was so sick of it from StarCraft 1. Uh, but congrats, cats. Everyone check out root4root.com on that. That's the uh, number four, not the word four. That's right. That's yes, right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to briefly go over Corrupted Cup, which, of course, Rap and I just got back from uh, yesterday morning. We we'll talking about nation wars a little bit. Spoiler: someone lost a hatchery. Uh, we also 
uh, are going to talk about uh, Adrian leaving Blizzard and I think a couple other things as well. So why don't we go ahead and jump into it, talk about Corrupted Cup first off. Uh, again, Rap and I just got back from Russia where we crowned the best non-Korean player in the world. And, you know, we had a Corrupted Cup preview episode with a bunch of uh, the North American pros right before leaving. And uh, everyone said Bonneth was going to win. How did that really? prediction turn out, Rapid? Uh, I would say that that was a pretty good prediction. I think it's it's maybe the boring prediction because uh, going into Corrupted Cup, uh, I don't think Bonneth had been playing uh, a ton. He played one group in BSL and outside of that, uh, maybe one game in STPL. So I think while everybody was just making that because, you know, Bonneth is one of the biggest names in non-Korean Brood War, um, uh, I, I that did in fact come true, but I think going into the tournament, there were actually quite a few players that uh were were favorites guys like uh DeWalt, True Touch, Kogut. Uh, these are all players that made it very far into the tournament, but I think there were also some really sick upsets in the tournament, including Artosis winning a game, uh, but, but also guys like Eon Zer getting knocked out very early, Lancer X, who placed very he was the highest placing Russian player from the 20th anniversary land, which is kind of the precursor to this tournament. He got knocked out first round by a certain someone, and uh. Yeah, uh, there were definitely a, a few upsets as the tournament went on. Yeah, it, it was really an excellent tournament, like a great atmosphere there. Really felt like the old days once again, all the Brood War guys having a great time together. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a kind of a big story as we hit the round of eight. Uh, both the Peruvian players made the top eight, and Terror ended up getting second place. Uh, and this is actually like a theme that's very quietly rising within many of the world's toughest esports that Peru is becoming a powerhouse. Like I've heard that some of the best Tekken players are now Peruvian. Oh, really? uh, I didn't know that one. Yeah, yeah. It, two of the best non-Asian uh, Warcraft 3 players are Peruvian players right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, two of the absolute best non-Korean StarCraft 1 players are Peruvian players. Uh, it's a pattern that really truly exists. I, in, I mean, cats are... Okay in Dota. Oh, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of that one, but it, yeah. why is Peru so strong? I wonder, it just, do you have, do you uh, have any, is it like a, is there some sort of cultural thing? Yeah, like, what what yeah. is your secret, cats? Uh, I would say that uh, PC cafes were very strong in Peru for many years, maybe less so now than before, but there was a big gaming culture boom at some point where, yeah, after school, people would just go, you know, play StarCraft or Counter-Strike or dota one or at least while i was growing up so um yeah a lot of that is that because especially when it comes to brood war like uh, lan was really important back then um so those pc cafes and pc banks i think they serve to foster a culture of yeah just going yeah that's and having fun you know, now that you mentioned that, actually, I remember back in the day that, like, for instance, during Clan Wars and stuff, we'd always have to wait because they're like, yeah, Caster's on his way to the PC cafe. Mm -hmm. And then when I was talking <laughs> to uh, Dandy and, and Terror, uh, they play from PC cafes really often, actually, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I guess, you know, that can help connection or whatever as well. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was I was actually talking to Terror too. Uh, so Terror, so the way the internet works in Peru, and maybe you can you know echo this, uh, Katz, is that it is um, it's very heavily monopolized. So if you yeah. want, so for the most part, the internet connection is relatively poor across the entire country. Obviously, if you live in like Lima or like a major city, it's gonna you're gonna have more options there. But because the internet is so monopolized you actually have to pay quite a bit in order it's to very get... expensive yeah yeah so in... streaming in peru is very difficult like upload is is very difficult to find yeah um so you kind of have to go for like you know the private companies that try to do it charge so much more like in the thousands so really um, yeah. what like you have to go with with one of the usually monopolized alternatives which is yeah just basically one or two companies and then the prices are yeah like three times as high as here for you know half or less than half of the speed wow that's that's PC crazy face to solve for that as well wow 
Yeah, I was talking to Terror, one of the the best Peruvian players who actually got second place in uh, the Corrupted Cup. And he, even though he actually has one of the best connections in Peru, he still his clan tag for the entire event was TR8 or turn rate eight, uh, f- indicating that he uh, usually plays with pretty high latency, which is sort of a yeah. Peruvian uh, stereotype. And there were crap. plenty of Peruvian lag jo- jokes going around at the end. It was no it was amazing. <laughs> um, but just to kind of rewind back to actual like corrupted cup conversation. If you guys it, didn't hear about this tournament, then you missed the last episode of the Pylon Show, so you can go back and watch that and then laugh at them for their wrong predict- predictions. But you guys have mostly had some right predictions. But if you are if you don't want to do that, it's like, like Artosa said earlier, the best non-Korean players coming together. And what was so cool about it is like, well, the tournament too, but is getting to see one of the only opportunities that happens each year of uh, the international StarCraft one community to come together and share like builds. One of the coolest things that I experienced during the tournament was just to go to the player area and hear players from all over the world. We had players from Kazakhstan. Uh, th- we had a Vietnamese player there, all these crazy Russian players that are just so, so good. Um, getting a chance to share this knowledge. And before, um, all of this like streaming and YouTube and all this crazy stuff, like like Team Liquid is like kind of the only place that happened. And uh, there were big tournaments like WCG where obviously this would sort of level up the entire scene. I think that's one of the biggest takeaways besides the actual tournament is just getting all of these, the best players from all over the world for StarCraft 1 together uh, to kind of just share all of this knowledge and play with each other even outside the tournament. That was just so amazing to watch. Yeah, that's always very fun about the live events. It's something that I guess, unless you're there, you don't get to experience. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, you, you, I. There's no way for me to have more fun than to <laughs> sit there and talk about TVP builds with Kogit, for instance. That's like that's the highlight of my year, basically. Is, you know, <laughs> other people who take the game seriously and, and know what they're talking about, discussing opening mm-hmm. build orders and things like yeah. that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the tournament was amazing. They've already confirmed Corrupted Cup again for next year. So that's going to be awesome. And Rapid, do you have the VODs up on YouTube? I do. I just uploaded the VODs to YouTube. Uh, there's a, it was a brief break in day one. So there's a two-parter for there. Um, uh, but uh, the link to that should be either, if it's not in the show notes, then I'll post it in chat uh, here in just a second. Uh, but essentially, this was one of the cool parts of uh, for, for me going there, because I wasn't going as a player. I was going as a person who grew up watching all kinds of these tournaments um, happen, whether it was WCG or a few of the uh, earlier international uh, Brood War tournaments. Uh, I was never able to be a part of any of those in person. So for me, this was such a huge opportunity to be a part of something that I grew up watching, but kind of disappeared by the time uh, I really got into esports. And so I got a chance to meet all these great, amazing players and Artosis, and uh, also have a chance to broadcast this for everyone else. And what was so cool about being a caster for Corrupted Cup is that I got a chance to broadcast in English, but we also had it broadcast uh, by two Russian language streams, uh, a Spanish language stream uh, for the Peruvian audience, and we also had a, a Polish language stream broadcast by Zero. Uh, if you don't know who Zero is, he's a, a big uh, Brood War tournament organizer. He runs the BSL uh, as well. And he had some of the craziest production uh, I've ever seen. He uh, made a like, he did a video call with his phone so he could go out into the player area and do live interviews with the players. He had some custom overlays and stuff. It was incredible. Uh, so really, really I loved the opportunity to, while all the foreign language players were talking with each other about playing the game, I got a chance to hang out with all the foreign language casters and talk about casting the game. Uh, And that was like so awesome to all kind of be crammed in this room, all casting. And in fact, if you watch the video, you're going to notice a lot of background noise, which is just either Polish people yelling or uh, people yelling in Spanish or people yelling in Russian. It was so crazy, so cool. Uh, to just hear all of that. And so uh, instead of complaining about there being a lot of background noise, just appreciate all of the like crazy hype that's going through in so many different languages for, for Brood War. Mm-hmm. Definitely one of the best parts of Corrupted Cup for me. Yeah. Well, it was uh, a great event and cannot wait for it to uh, gear up again <laughs> next year. 
So, Can we talk about um, your your experience then as a player? <laughs> like you qualified? For yeah. Hey, that's pretty impressive in itself. I saw like JM was in the bracket and like a lot of good players, right? I didn't see G5, however, or Nyokin. I'm not <laughs> sure what they are. Or yeah, what? no, they they didn't uh, play. I mean, they're they're fantastic players uh, as well. I beat uh, when I qualified. It was all Zerg players that I ended up beating, nice. like Tai Tu and and Crossy and uh, some other people too. And then you beat um, the number one Russian seed. That's pretty impressive. I watched the game, Lancer X. Now people were saying, oh, yeah. people were saying. Artos is going to open double factory. And I'm like, no, Artos is rageous when people open double factory. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm very good at two factory builds. Um, but I, I practiced like purely uh, mechanical macro builds going into the event. So I didn't end up using any uh, overly aggressive plays. But yeah, I made out of my group and then got into the second group phase and narrowly lost there in some frustrating games. But <laughs> you know, the nice thing about uh, a tournament like this is the thing is there's like no you can't go to a live event and have excuses afterwards. So whatever happens, you have to take that very seriously and be like, OK, this is what needs to be fixed. So although I didn't do as well as I thought I would be able to do and I feel kind of disappointed in my play, the the overall event was amazing. And I feel like I have learned a lot about my play and the holes in it. So. Very happy I, thought, I thought you were dead. It was like two base against four, but I guess that's pretty standard in Brood War, right? Like there Yeah, are... there's there's a window. Well, the build I did was specific. Like that's exactly how that ends up is two base against four, and then you kill them real quick uh, mm -hmm. in that specific game that you're talking about against Lancer. Yeah. But uh, the way the game opened, I decided pretty early to do that strat because I was reading what he was doing pretty well. So, And he did exactly what I thought, so it worked out really well. The Reaver was carry. Killed some uh, uh, supply depots. <laughs> yeah, that the Reaver counter was pretty good, but the initial Reaver was yeah, that didn't do anything. Did nothing at all, which is really what you need to stop. And then I kind of screwed up a little bit, but it was okay. Um, yeah. yeah, it was it was a very very fun time. Really enjoyed it. I mean, top twelve, not too bad, I guess. <laughs> not um, too bad. Yeah, and uh, just in case you guys are wondering uh, about maybe you can't watch. I think we had 18 total hours of broadcast time. It was basically nine hours a day. If you don't want to watch 18 hours of Corrupted Cup, uh, the, the finals are, are very, very good. And then uh, I would also say uh, like the, the semifinals uh, were really, really good games uh, as well. So um, if you want to just like browse through day two, there's a lot of uh, really cool StarCraft there. Basically, the entire tournament was great. So you can't go wrong. Yeah. Yeah, just an awesome tournament. So definitely check that out on uh, Rapid's uh, YouTube channel or his Twitch channel. I think they're in both locations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure you'll put out some tweets and stuff that people can find those more easily. I will. All right. Well, let's switch over into some StarCraft II Nation Wars because <clears throat> obviously we had uh, the Nation Wars go forward. And I did hear a rumor about someone killing someone else's hatcher. I believe we have a clip for that. <laughs> oh, God. Have you seen the clip, Dan? Or just uh, heard the rumor? I, I heard a rumor. I didn't see I, the clip. Oh, you must see the clip then. That's great. Got to pull it up one second. Okay. It's being pulled up. That's right. Yeah, we planted some... the clip, and it's about to grow into a big, beautiful clip <laughs> tree right before our eyes. What type of tree? A eucalyptus? <laughs> what? Matt, if you could no, uh, nothing there. hang up okay. artosis right now. <laughs> I was excited. You nailed the joke earlier, Rapid. It was very impressive. Uh, what was it on? Mm, I forgot. Did I? Nailed it, yeah. Well, in the, oh. in the interview with Wow, Dan. I'm so proud of myself for, for nailing that joke. Yeah. Okay, well, let's watch this clip. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Oh, this is the top five place. This, is, this one's the best. We, we could talk through it if you want to yeah. play the video. Okay. No, no, all right, okay. all right. So, like, you know, cats. I mean, obviously, I'm looking cool at this you bracket know, right now, and I see that uh, not only did you go ahead and defeat the Mus Zero. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, no, that's the wrong bracket. Uh, I, well, I did. Oh, that was the guy you beat, right? Okay, so like on screen right now, that's no regret. Um, doing the build that I made for a laser. That's this is the top five place of uh, H2. Oh, uh, okay. And this is now Ion Jin doing it against Nice. 
<laughs> Wait, did the, he did the same? Then, oh my god! Everyone, awesome. everyone was doing the same build, and I was really sad because I wasn't watching these games. Okay, like this this build I actually also gave to Sue, and he used it twice in the Chinese uh, league against uh, I don't know who and Hero, and Hero barely stopped it. But Sue was hitting at like 350. These guys are hitting at like 330. I can hit at like 310 now. So I thought the build was pretty optimized. I like I optimized. This is now me failing against Has the same build. So, <laughs> but by the time I was executing on this build, everyone was doing it and I wasn't aware. So it's so popular that everyone just has the pylon where they need to have it and just have proper responses to the build now. So on the ladder, I never lost with this build pretty much. But now apparently everyone was doing it. And then when I listened to the casters, they were like, yeah, we were expecting Katz to come up with something, but he was just doing the same thing as everyone. I'm like, I mean, it's my thing, you know? <laughs> like I, I just wasn't aware it had spread as much as it had. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But I almost wish I didn't share it. And then I might have beat Has too. Um, but yeah, that was great. Uh, Nation Wars uh, was a fantastic experience for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I love I love this uh, highlights because four four of the top five plays are me. And it's, yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Is that the official highlight reel, where it's just yeah, a bunch yeah. of it's, it's just bunch of cats it. built? <laughs> it's just cats built. Yeah. <laughs> this was a game against Nice. Nice is you know. I think one of the better Taiwanese players. I was very happy with him. Yeah, yeah, no, he's he's quite strong. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I, you ended up killing a Serral Hatchery, right? I've heard about this, but I haven't oh, seen it. Yeah, you're gonna see it. It's the, it's the next clip. That one's my favorite. Okay, wow. God. So for the Serral Hatchery, if you wanna, if, if I may quickly toot my own horn here, um, <laughs> I actually didn't have any builds in CVC that are like very unique or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was playing Serral, you know, or, or I was expected to play Serral. So I I came up with it like an hour and a half or two hours before the match. Um, mm -hmm. And it's this this clip. So watch it then. I think you're going to enjoy it. Watch Mr. Big Brain versus Miss, biggest Mr. Big Brain. <laughs> okay. So the evil block actually makes it so oh, wow. you can't get the... Full surround and but can't he drill just, towards the top gas? Then? Drones, uh, he has to make a gas that. first, and that's where the Mr. Bigger Brain comes in because uh, the second game. Oh yeah. Yeah. So the second game he prepares and he has a drone by the gas upon seeing the drone, and then he drills. Um, so that's the next the the clip that follows this is his response. He adapted very quickly. Um, so here, here it goes. Of course, this is a Pogs longer... in the chat, please. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> this is, see, like, see the gas now. He's making it. So, that so was, he makes I mean, that the was... gas to drill the drones, and he just, like, figures mm -hmm. this out in the span of, like, minutes. Yep. Damn. Damn. So that, was, that was brilliant by him. Um, but there's ways to bypass that as um, the number one place an interview for some reason. But... Uh, <laughs> There's ways to, to bypass that because the the tell is that the, they see the drone coming, right? So so there's ways that you can hide the drone. But again, like I came up with this like two hours before. I tested it twice mm -hmm. against Vive and it did good enough. So I brought it out. No, that's super sick. It, well, the next iteration, you're supposed to take his gases while rushing his hatch, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you just hide the drone and then the drone arrives late enough. Like, I don't think you can take the gas as a response because it's on the other yeah. side if, if, you, if the drone just appears there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's... And then if the gases happen to be tucked up against their... Yeah, there should be maps where, where, yeah. where, just, where the gas response is just not a thing. Um, and I'm sure there's other ways to go about it, but I think this is probably the most reliable way that that uh, that you that you can stop it. Mm -hmm. It's been working pretty well on the ladder whenever people don't just pull first against me every time. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, congrats! It looks like you had some great results there uh, for you personally. Although Peru, mm. unfortunately, falling out <laughs> in third place. Uh, Ryu, does he have dual citizenship with Italy, or does he yeah, live there? Apparently so. Yeah, that was disappointing that he signed up for, <laughs> for uh, Italy because he's actually probably the best Peruvian player. He's mm -hmm. like uh, six point oh. one, six point two. Um, I try hard against them on the ladder though, and the last uh, qualifier I actually beat him as well. But. <laughs> but he's but he's you know much higher in MMR than me so he's, yeah. he's it would have helped if he was on Team Peru we might have been able to 
bruise some more people. Uh, but yeah, it is what it is. Mm. Okay. Uh, I don't know how much of Nation Wars you guys caught. Obviously, uh, Rap and I were traveling this past weekend, so maybe missed a little bit of it. Uh, any uh, Anything stand out? Uh, Rainer like a... killed uh, France. <laughs> that was awesome. That's pretty sick, yeah. Yeah, he's he's very, very strong right now. Um, I th He's in Korea now. Uh, I think he's number one on the ladder. Um, number one on the ladder in Korea? Damn. Yeah. And Scarlet is number two, actually. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Dark's going to uh, step it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And then there's... Um, oh, the Soul versus Sordo, for anyone that didn't watch that match. That was one of the best. Maybe my favorite CVT of the year. That was just really? amazing. Yeah, those are maybe two of the most mechanically focused European players. Mm. Um, they're just very, very strong. They don't miss a beat. They click super fast. They click everywhere. And uh, it was it was crazy. Like, it was impossible to tell who was winning. It was just very back and forth, back and forth. Mm. Tit for tat, you know. One kills an expansion. The other one wipes the army, kills their <laughs> expansion. Army wiped, kills their expansion. And just, yeah, it went on like that for a while. So that was... a. A brilliant game. So that game was awesome. But what is it with like Zerg players and all kills? Because Rainer all killed for Italy. And then uh, Elazer, right after that game, I was like, wow, this is so sick. Wow, sort of, uh, spoiler alert, sort of sort of wins that. And then Elazer comes back and all kills uh, Sweden. I was like, oh, okay, well. Um, I, I mean, sort of won like the hard game of mm -hmm. that series. And then uh, Elazer's just like, okay, well, none of that matters anymore. I'm just going to. Killer. Yeah, I mean, Elaser's just, uh, I think, the best player in that, uh, in that clan war. And mm -hmm. Raynor, arguably only, maybe Petit Drogo can beat Raynor, but outside of that, I mean, the guy's number one on yeah. Korea, right? So he's pretty powerful as well. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I didn't get a chance to watch too many uh, of the games from, I guess that was the round of 24. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I was still pretty impressed with, uh, like, Croatia beat um australia and for the most part that's uh goblin uh the big croatian player uh who really really stepped it up so glad to see him uh, what's his uh, uh the sidekick what's his name blask oh really... yeah blask yeah yeah i had never really heard of blask too much because uh, i didn't watch a lot of european starcraft too uh but uh yeah i was i was watching this guy and i was like okay wow you know this is this is legit um yeah. but everything else kind of made sense to me uh Kind of, I mean, uh, even that, even that, I would argue, Croatia's probably as strong, if not stronger, than Australia. Um, okay. So yeah, I think there were pretty much no upsets for the most part. Um, but yeah, yeah, Blask has been stepping it up. That's exciting. Goblin is always on and off. He's he doesn't play. To he plays he plays a lot, and then he doesn't play, and then he plays a lot type thing. So mm -hmm. he kind of falls on and off, and he's he's a very smart kid as well. So he's very. Um, Ad he adapts a lot and has like his own <coughs> style and build orders and that's that's just kind of be bound to be hit or miss. Yeah, what mm. uh, what nation do you think looked the strongest? I got a chance to watch Germany play and I was just like, okay, this is so good. I cannot I cannot imagine. Uh, what what nation looks the strongest to you, cats? I mean, with this format, it maybe Finland, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, there's there's Finland, then there's Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Each with one player. Uh, Korea has three players, so that's nice. Uh, the Netherlands has a couple of very strong players. Germany, uh, Germany is you say a couple Germany of strong players. Is Rhett not fielded on that team? Do we have no faith in Rhett? Uh, I mean, Rhett's awesome. <laughs> hey, if there, if it, if uh, if it was a combination of Brood War and StarCraft Two in this tournament, Rhett would be the MVP. He would be. He would be. Sarah would have no, no chance. chance. No. no chance. Yeah. Well, they go one and one, I guess. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but Red would get more points or more XP, you know, for ah, yeah, unit yeah, kills yeah. or something. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, let's take a look, I guess, at the round of sixteen brackets because those have been released for Nation Wars. Uh, on Group A, we have Canada versus Russia and Italy versus Taiwan. Group B, we have USA versus Ukraine and South Korea versus Netherlands. Group C, Poland versus France and Finland versus Croatia. Group D, Germany versus Mexico and China versus Brazil. Hype. Yeah, there's there's a few very difficult groups here, isn't there? I, I mean, most of them look pretty... Uh, so, 
you have to you can't just like look at the nation's flag and think how are all of the players from this country versus all of the players from this other country because it's also like about specifically which players will represent uh which country and i know specifically uh you know there's been some uh, some issues with uh, russia and which players are representing mm -hmm. uh, them there and i think that while there might not be these graphic issues with other countries there are some countries that have obviously very very deep talent pools but obviously you can't Is it represent the same everybody. format same format i assume for this i think it's the same format if it's not I'm, i wasn't aware yeah so. yeah i would guess so so yeah if it's the same format i mean scarlet seems to be in great shape right now mm -hmm. yeah i which is also but can of... she can she beat rainer <laughs> in that final match right because that's what it'll come down to is the winners yeah that's the winners finals that's i mm -hmm. mean that's number one and number two potentially from the korean server yeah yeah each other and scarlet seems to have a really good win rate there too dark mm -hmm. i think is number three but he has the best win rate out of them uh, yeah i was um i was watching scarlet's uh wesg uh qualifier games and i was just like wow this is actually uh, she's looking in in incredible right now so besides mm -hmm. if you watch you know canada's nation wars games uh i think probably the favorite of the group along with italy so that that's gonna be a really sick uh, fi yeah, it final. comes down to Scarlet versus Rainer. I don't think anyone else is going to beat him. Yeah. Well, um, maybe the Riddler can tire Rainer, <laughs> right? And then she can take him down. Yeah. Maybe that'll be that's, past Rainer's I think that's time. the play, right? Yeah. No, you you get him real tired, especially if the time zones are a bit off for him. Oof. Yeah. That's where the Riddler really comes in. <laughs> yeah. The secret weapon. Yeah. Eventually, Rainer's like just barely killing everything, and then he sees command centers going every direction. He's got to chase them all down. Yeah, you play um, like a two-hour game, then <laughs> then no regret for the for the fast, uh, hard pace change, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then a real ZVZ. There you go. <laughs> he's not gonna know any. Italy. He's not gonna know where his head is anymore, right? It's like play a two-hour yeah. game, then play a two-minute game. It's. Oof. Yeah, it's just the top one, or it looks like the top two actually all qualify from all these, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess that makes it a bit a better. There's also a loser's bracket. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, do we want to go wins, through? Who wins in Group C is what I'm really looking at here, because I'm like, is Cyril good enough to beat everyone in Poland, France? Uh, can we look at the? Can we put them on screen? Yeah. Um, sure. Well, wait. Are we just like skipping Group B? What about America, Dan? <laughs> oh, I expect M Canning to lead that team right Okay, through. all right, all right. Anyway, moving on. Okay, so here we'll put it on screen one second. <laughs> Group B. Um uh, the US okay. against the Ukraine. I think I don't think there's anyone that can be Neeb in the Ukraine. Is there? Oh, well, I mean I, I could see possibly, right? Like Hellraiser versus Neeb PvP, maybe he can mm. take him down or something. Obviously Neeb yeah. favored, but Yeah. Unlikely. And um and future is very strong as well. And M Canning's no, yeah. you know, he can M Canning can take games from anyone. So, kind of a wild card there. Mm -hmm. I would say the U.S. Yeah. is looking pretty strong there. Um, yeah, I think obviously South Korea, the favorite of the group overall. But yeah, um, yeah. I, I think it could actually be close. I think uh, Netherlands is not. You know, maybe in, in past Nation Wars, Netherlands has looked like super, super strong. Because uh, I don't think Euthermal is as strong this year as he has been like, a, say, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, Harstam is very strong right now. Though. Yeah. That, well, that's kind of the, the counterpoint is that Harstam is actually probably better than he's been in past years. I would say so. Yeah, but I've been hearing less year of Harstam memory. So <laughs> is he really stronger? <laughs> that's how yeah, you judge it. It's like... He's... He's been consistently up there in the European yeah. ladder as well, you know, training games. Always been one of my favorite foreign pro dosses, no doubt. Same. He's great. Yeah. So, oh. so your question for Group C. Dan, yes. Can't... My question stands: Is like a laser just going to body this group, or because mm. when I look at the actual lineups, like the France lineup and the Germany lineup are my favorite lineups through the whole tournament. Like yeah. both those look very, very, very strong and balanced. Yeah. But then, of course, you know, we got like Rainer on Italy and Sarah on. I think France will be for them. speak poorly of their teammates, but you like, know. I think Petit Drogo matches up well against the laser. I think that Clem mm -hmm. matches up well against the laser. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think France in general is just really strong. So anyone can beat a laser and then, you know, yeah. then there's a little bit of a drop off from there. Uh, I guess Sol is really good, but he doesn't really tend to perform that well in a, 
in tournaments. Uh, he's he's so mechanical. He, he has yeah. a very linear approach to things and in tournaments yeah. you can really abuse that whereas on the ladder you want to practice so you're like okay you know make your nine command centers <laughs> yeah yeah no it, that's exactly the way that i view soul yeah. as well where if he adds a little bit more depth of strategy then yeah. he'll be just uh, monstrous like one of yeah. the players that you're looking at to possibly get to blizzcon next year for instance yeah but yeah. i mean his mindset itself like when you talk to the guy like he thinks about in terms of what's best, like how many units is best, what's be like nine CCs is best, or like, you know, like yeah. it's just he has a, such a methodical approach that I think that's bound to be limiting. But that's also the source of his very strong mechanics because he does the same thing every game. Mm -hmm. um, I think that group, obviously, you know, Cyril's going to be the favorite or Finland, I guess I should refer to by nations, <laughs> but. Um, I, for me, it's going to be really cool to watch probably like either Poland or France, I, I think, can make it Croatia kind of an underdog. But um, I would say watching uh, Elazer play in the round of 24, he just looks like super on fire. And I remember the uh, the finals of uh, GSL versus the world was uh, Elazer versus Cyril. So if we have that matchup happen at any point, that's going to be super sick. I think we're probably going to see France versus Finland in the winners' finals. Okay. And uh, I mean, for me, that's super exciting to see Cyril run through the gauntlet of, of France because it is so powerful. Yeah. Like each one of yeah. those players, like Marine Lord, played an amazing game against Cyril just in Challenger recently, right? Like, could have gone either way. I thought he was going to win. Most players thought he was going to win in the chat. Mm. Um, then Clem is, you know, is up there in MMR, just like trailing like just 200 MMR behind. Same for Petit Drogo. So. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be awesome if it happens. Yeah. Well, what about uh, Group D here? They like it seems like Germany, no matter what, should be able to top to this. But yeah. from the other three countries, I almost kind of just feel like Mexico should do pretty well. Like Cham and Special are obviously so so strong. What are you guys yeah. thinking? I think that Special can upset Germany right by himself. Yeah, it's I mean, possible. It's a good day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anyone in Germany that's super favored against them. I think they're all like even-ish, if not mm -hmm. major above everyone, maybe even with Showtime. Um, and Cham can also upset, like he's, you know, yeah. he trails like two, 300 MMR below. Mm -hmm. The whole of Team Germany, I think he's very strong. Uh, Jim yeah. Rising, uh, <laughs> I mean, he's definitely going to show up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what a thing to say about a player it's like i believe this player will play starcraft and i'm like well <laughs> you know you might be onto something it's like he's, he's actually got very strong cvc and uh the thing about jim rising is he's completely unpredictable because he'll, yeah he'll just do things that don't make any sense so it's like you know if you're one of a lambo a very very strong thinking player you know you might mind game yourself against jim mm -hmm. uh okay well I think that's a pretty good preview of the Nation Wars. Thanks, guys. Uh, definitely, everyone, check that out. You can check out nationwars.tv to continue to follow this forward. Such a fun event each year. Mm -hmm. uh, before we jump into our next main topic, there are a few things. We'll have the full This Week in StarCraft stuff gone over at the end of the show um, after the Patreon questions and everything, and we close out. Uh, but there are a few announcements that we wanted to do that were kind of time sensitive for some community stuff going on. So first up there is uh, the Alpha SC2 Team League. Uh, the registration for the NA and EU uh, scenes ends on October 23rd. So that's like before the next pylon show, basically. So if you want to play in Alpha, uh, the Alpha X SC2 Team League, Definitely do check that out. That's at alpha.tl, A-L-P-H-A dot T-L. And of course, this is all within the show notes as well. Uh, we also have the Diamond League uh, from Duddles. And the registration is opening up for player and captains. Um, and so definitely go and check that out. It's I'm not going to read out this URL. It's very, very long. But <laughs> if you're interested in that, definitely go sign up. And there's also uh, La Espira. Am I saying that right, Katz? Uh, close enough. Nice. La Espira? La yes. Espira, yeah. Uh, that is, of course, it's it's like the Pylon Show in Spanish. So <laughs> I'm sure it's a great show. Check it out. They're talking about Nation Wars Balance and uh, Why Lo Que Se Viene. 
Um, whatever that is. <laughs> you okay, and what's coming? Yeah. What's coming? Yeah. yeah, that's what I said, guys. I mean, come on. Uh, also, Wilo is the cousin to J Lo, by the way. <laughs> Uh, we also have from the Australian Esports Federation that SC2 LAN event that did get put off because of uh, the Super Tournament that has Australia, Namshar, Solar, and Probe. And that is coming up this weekend. It starts in two days. So you definitely want to check that out. $5,000 on the line down in Australia. Some really great players there. Uh, and of course, the New York City LAN number two. That's also in two days. Uh, it's a Brood War tournament in New York City. Tons of the top players like Tai Tu and Nyokin are going to be there. I think Models is going to go down. There's lots of good players in the Northeast. Uh, so mm-hmm. if you're in that area, definitely check out the New York City land, whether you're going to play or just spectate. It's, it's awesome. So again, all those can be found uh, within the show notes. Uh, speaking of which, Katz, you had something about Tespa that you were casting? Uh, I am casting Tespa on the weekends with uh cold terran and awesome sauce mm-hmm. yeah that's that's pretty much the tldr but yeah it's you know, <laughs> Tespa's always always been tespa it's um uh, you know less than optimal play most often so there's a lot of uh room to learn there's a lot of mismatch ups where you get diamonds playing against grandmasters <laughs> but it's kind of fun because um you know you get to pinpoint all the mistakes that that make the difference there uh, very clearly, very easily. So I think it's a it's a good opportunity to learn. It's not the most exciting um, cast for me in particular. <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah. I'm casting and I'm like, oh man, it feels bad. But I, but I like to share um, insights and knowledge and 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 with the players as well. So yeah, I think that's a great way to learn about StarCraft. Like you can watch um, GSL, for instance, and I'll try to point out little things that they might be doing wrong. But there's going to be like far fewer of them it's not going to line up with your games as much there's more mind games going on and mm-hmm. a lot of builds that are based purely off execution which are you know you look at that and you're like well i'm going to do zest build it's like you're not going to do zest build because it's based off execution you can't do that whereas something like a collegiate league is going to be more uh Here's much easier to learn from sense. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's very clear a lot of the time, but there is some good matches as well. There's some good players. Uh, so those are always exciting. And as the weeks progress, the games get better as well. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, definitely, uh, everyone, look at that. Um, okay. We have a couple more things to jump over to. The BlizzCon groups are Ooh. out. Yes, they finally got announced. The reason why it was kind of slowed down was, again, this is something that I've been talking about for months. Originally, it seemed like Classic wasn't going to be able to go. Uh, His military service is coming up. And as your military service draws close uh, in South Korea, you get banned from travel. Uh, But from what I understand, uh, Kespa stepped in and helped out. They're they're kind of... um, They work with the government or whatever, and they got him the ability to travel for BlizzCon. So Classic was able to end up playing at the end, which is really good for him, really sad for TY, who, yeah. who, who would have picked up that spot if he had uh, remained banned. But obviously Classic did better this year, so yeah. very, very well-deserved. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's good for it's good for TY also because he'll get to cash in regardless of whether he plays or not because uh, he's, uh, he's going to be getting those big caster bucks. But uh, I, I think it's really happy for everyone. Also, I think it's the secretary or general secretary, secretary general of uh, Kespa um, that uh, kind of stepped in because Kespa is like uh, the gaming part of the government. It's actually like a government body kind of thing. It's really closely connected in there. They have a Senate seat, which is always kind of blowing my mind. And I was just like, wow, this is like, this is how crazy uh, uh, gaming is involved in uh, in Korea. And so they, they appealed on behalf of Classic, uh, who would ordinarily not have been allowed to leave, uh, to get special permission to leave. So big win there for Classic. Mm-hmm. Uh... Okay, let's let's go over these groups real quick yeah. and see. We, oh my God, cats! Yeah, start with, start that with is the group. cutest dog I've ever seen. What are we doing here? She's pretty. Cute. She's been. Oh growling, my! So. I just want to give her so many kisses. <laughs> hey, Cobra, if you could just full screen only cats' dog, we can, <laughs> we can just talk about this as the next uh, the next StarCraft topic on is, on this week in StarCraft, and it's only cats' dog. <laughs> is it cat? Is cats' dog the next Bonjoa? Yes, I think so. Also. Let's talk what about is this the, puppy's the, name. This puppy's so fluffy. Cosita. 
conceded that. that. She used to be fluffy, right? And she got a haircut recently. But but the elephant in the room that no, I'm just gonna say what we're all thinking. Shouldn't you have cats? That's the first no. time I hear that joke in the last uh, 15 years. Thank you very much. Dogs are dogs are the best. Like seriously, it's so yeah. it's not even close. Not even. Um, close. That is just such a cute dog. Okay, so <laughs> let's let's talk about Group A. Uh, we have Special, Sue, Dark, Showtime. Damn. All these groups, actually, it's like as soon as I read that, I'm like, oh, is that the group of death? And I glance at the others. I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> like, in comment, actually, that is, yeah, yeah. It's pretty. It's pretty stuck. Yeah, yeah. It's. It turns out the uh, end of the year, the top players getting in there. It's pretty strong. Uh, so, what do you guys think about this group? Um, this special Sue Dark Showtime. I want to say Dark is the the only clear favorite there, uh, mm -hmm. and then. Out of the other three, anyone can make it, I think. Yeah. Would you yeah, agree? I think Dark right. is uh, super, super strong, um, which is, you know, these are not, this is not like rocket science analysis. It's like, wow, these strong players can win the game. Yes. Uh, I, I think it's really unfortunate because I think in almost any other group, Special and Showtime would have just like a really, really uh, strong chance. But man, you just got to put them against these monsters of Korean Zerg. And I think besides the balance, consider, can, considerations about zerg being super strong right now um man i'm feeling for him uh, i think maybe sue is underperforming a little bit right now but it's hard to say that because he's also been winning games mm. um so i think dark for sure in first and then i'd say between special and showtime but that's clearly my foreign bias coming through okay okay uh how about group b here maru stats time Seril. I gotta say, I'm feeling a little bit bad for time. He's had a magnificent year. This yeah. is a tough group, and the thing is, like, he's even had good games against like Serral and stuff. Like, we've seen just really great play out of him. But mm -hmm. when I look at the fact he has to play each of the other races, and it's like basically the strongest mm. player from every race. He's <laughs> yeah. My, yeah, I, I'm not feeling time too heavily for this group. <laughs> yeah, as far as perception goes, I mean, they're probably the three strongest representatives yeah. of each race, yeah. right? Like. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, time is gonna have a tough one. But I mean, he could upset. He could be. He could yeah. be one of them. Like uh, uh, yeah, he really overperformed the last WCS event uh, of the year. So it's like I I don't know. I think obviously the underdog. But yeah, like good luck throwing your 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 StarCraft bones or however whatever arcane eldritch way you want to predict this group. Because holy. I mean, Cyril, Cyril has to advance one way or the other, I think. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. It's like stats on Maru, right? Like Cyril could actually mm -hmm. not advance, and I, and I wouldn't be. If I mean, there was a group he wasn't going to advance out of, maybe that would be yeah. as close as you could get to that. Yeah. I it, mean, if Cyril didn't advance from this group, like I'd be surprised. But if I then looked at the matchups, I'd be like, ah, okay, like lost one, two to Maru. That's, mm. you know, like that's possible, I guess. And, Ah, it's yeah. If I'm not mistaken, let me just check real quick. But I think it's uh, Maru versus Time to open, right? Let me check this real quick. Wait, so does this? Assume yeah, it's Maru versus Time, Sats versus Serral. By the way, this is all best of five, so we really get to see some good matches. Uh, obviously, it is heavily favored to be Maru versus Serral. Yes, finally, Over fifth fifteen hundred uh, KST. Yes. One Finally, week, one day from today. I can't believe that we've had to watch wait this long for Mara versus Serral and BlizzCon. Like, like we were obviously robbed because Mara decided to go 03 to SOS last year for some reason. I don't know why that needed to happen, but okay. But now it makes this year so much more epic. I uh, I don't know. Uh, Illegal Act had it like uh, was it fifty five or it was like fifty two forty eight. So I'm just like, okay, well, that's very unhelpful for me. Um, <laughs> but finally, we get it. Who wins it though? Maru. Mm. Maru. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Cats? It's difficult to say because of the quality of practice that Cyril gets versus the quality of practice that mm. Maru gets, perhaps. Mm. Right? Like in terms, of, like there's not that many. Great European uh, Terrans. So hopefully Cyril can practice with uh, with some Korean Terrans or some European, some of the top European Terrans exclusively. 
Mm -hmm. I think he's still favored, honestly. He's just so good. Yeah. If I could predict Amaru 4-0 for a best of five, I would. Um, and uh, you can you can see my my logic from my previous pylon shows. But I think, uh, I, I don't know. It could obviously go either way. And I think the fun of that is going to be watching the games, not predicting the games. Predicting the games, some people like, get really into that. And I'm just like, okay, well, you're really cashing in early on this one. Uh, but I don't know. It's All of these groups have something that's just either we've been anticipating you really want to see like the climactic buildup i don't think any one of these groups is just like the boring group you know yeah yeah They're all yeah. Stacked. i agree with that uh okay so group c classic hero marine hero and rainer this one's pretty nuts as well that is i think that that is about as hard to predict as <laughs> yeah. anything really well, that's technically, like technically Dan, yeah. if you run the illegal act numbers on every single mm. group, which I thankfully have done, uh, group A is actually the uh, hardest group to predict because illegal act predicts three two victories between every single member in that group, uh, including yeah. uh, the, the the finals. And uh, each of group B, C, and D have um, three some three ones mixed in there. And the mm -hmm. second hardest group to predict would have been group C, which has higher percentage splits on the three twos, but also predicts uh, group uh, or that to be the, the second hardest. So you're, you're, you're close, Dan. I'd imagine, okay. I'd imagine that that has to do with uh, Hero Marine's performance over the years against Koreans, though, because mm. it mm. hasn't been great before. But I think he's in peak form right now. Yeah. Um, he's been playing against Koreans. His his steady progression, I think, is going to hit a break point that a program like Illegal Act can't foresee, where it's like it's just his base is getting higher and higher and higher and higher. And yeah, like eventually he will hit the level where he starts actually just killing everybody. It's it's I think. It, yeah, I think it, it might surprise a bunch of people when it happens, because he'll go from, you know, like what, 40 percent versus Koreans to like 60 just suddenly. But bigger and it's, bigger it's and coming bigger. i don't know if it's going to be at this blizzcon but it it could be yeah it could yeah. be I, think, I like to I think, think maybe matches poorly against hero though like hero mm. is such a such a strong aggressive player whereas classic is more macro oriented and so is mm. i think that's where it, where hero marines like strength dies in the macro game like he doesn't miss a beat mm -hmm. so i think you know i think it's going to be a, a yeah and I, I would hate to see Raynor not advance. He's so strong right now, but this group is scary for anyone, I think. Yeah, Hero, uh, from what I understand, is top one or two PVZ -er right now. Mm -hmm. So if mm. someone's going to kill Raynor in that matchup, <laughs> this is actually like the best bet maybe in the tournament to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people look at this group and they just assume that Raynor will make it out because he's mm -hmm. just so good. And a lot of people are just like classic fanboys because of the difficulty he's going to have getting to blizzcon and now he's here but i don't think that it's it's wrong to predict you know rainer and classic as technical yeah. favorites but um i don't know i'm still i'm still in the immortal words of bonnie tyler holding out for a hero uh mm. i'm not sure which <laughs> one though yeah honestly like looking at the groups i almost feel like this is the worst group that rainer could be in in some ways with the the differences in players and stuff it's kind of funny because he is someone I would just suspect because I feel like he is like a top eight player in the world. But Easily, yeah. yeah, I look at this group and I'm like, oh, that's actually like in a very weird way, very tough, even though you don't look at that and you're like, oh, I see the BlizzCon winner in there. But still, you know, I, I see <laughs> players that can kill Rainer in there. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Classic yeah. versus Hero, I think, mm -hmm. is probably favored for Classic. Like I, this, this, I, this whole thing, when I think of like, play styles and how they match match up against each other it's so weird mm -hmm. like it feels like someone will be you know they will all beat each other type thing yeah <laughs> yeah it weird. does feel like that absolutely i think a lot of people are considering only the skill matchups and not the true matchup and that is uh the meme matchup in which big gabe topples everyone big <laughs> shout out to uh was it vorzov for that meme that cobra showed there on on uh screen that was uh top tier what are what are the starting games for this? Who who versus? Uh, so the starting games are Classic versus Hero Marine and Hero versus Rainer. Okay, so I'm gonna predict that Hero upsets Rainer. Yeah. And Big Gabe upsets Classic. I like, could oof. absolutely see that. 
I could yeah. absolutely see that. Wow. Especially like classics PVT style generally against what Hero Marine does because Hero Marine's so solid and classic looks for holes in the like early game. Yeah. Yeah, I could absolutely see that being the case. And I and I think after that, then Raynor still qualifies. Mm. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure what how the matchups like happen after that. But yeah, I think it's yeah. it's a pretty crazy group. Yeah, definitely agree. All right, last group, Group D, Trap, a Laser, Rogue, Neeb. And that's that's who they play to. It's Rogue versus Neeb, and it's yeah. Trap versus Laser. Yeah. This group has the very uh, the very unique characteristic of uh, figuring out whether or not you are banned from uh, slash r slash trap fanboys, uh, because I feel like you have to be a member of that subreddit to predict him making it out of that group. I don't know. It's It's tough. For, for my man, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I it's, hmm. it's impossible for me to judge this group free of bias because I'm, you know, a huge like Neeb and a laser fan, but then you have Rogue in there and you're like, okay, well, I guess I have to predict him. Maybe fine. You know, yeah. this, it's kind of funny because a laser and Rogue are very, very, very different Zergs. So you have to bring kind of different styles against them. Like, for instance, if Trap opens with his standard Stargate stuff against Rogue, like, no, you're dead. Get out of here. If he does it against a laser, I'm more willing to see that possibly being okay, you know? Because I generally consider a laser slightly more aggressive, less late game oriented player, whereas Rogue just wants to build drones. So, yeah, the Oracles will allow that. Yeah. Yeah. And we already know that Knee Bones Trap. We've seen that years ago. Oh, oh, yeah. (laughs) D A E Kespa Cup. Yeah. I'm going to say Rogue and Neeb probably events here. Rogue and Neeb. Really? Okay. It's a difficult one because they match up. um, Yeah. They match up first, you said? Rogue versus Neeb? Yes. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. yeah. That was. Man. Do you remember that match from 2017? I the don't. only player that could beat Rogue in a macro game was Neeb that year. Nice. It was crazy. Imagine voting against a Zerg player to win in a group. You guys are not playing the the, the meta these days. <laughs> well, yeah. we're we're yeah, ahead of the meta. Yeah, Even if I'm wrong, at least Reddit will agree with me. So there's my true victory in the end. Mm. All right. Guys, who's who's gonna win BlizzCon, do you think? So I mean <laughs> Cyril? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think Cyril ZDZ is good enough that he'll do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I would say <laughs> probably Dark Cyril Finals is like, I, my illegal act answer is Cyril too, because he does have the statistical advantage when it comes to inevitably being the, the BlizzCon champion, but it's uh, 0.6%. So I don't know how much you can uh, read into that one. 0.6% um, versus Dark? Yeah. Oh, really? Dark yeah. usually gets smashed by Rogue, though, right? In CVC, I think that's like yeah. the the, the and... sword axe spear triangle. It's like one of them does smash the other. Mm. Mm-hmm. The thing is, like, I I think Dark will probably hit. Like, it, I mean, I guess it matters how the brackets come out. I feel like he'll definitely hit like a top four, possibly a top two. Yeah, but I think Serral and Rogue are just better ZVZ. So I actually I think one of those two is going to win this year. It, I really get the feeling that it is going to come down to which of these macro zergs is best CVZ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Rogue I, I mean, Cyril has shown Cyril. it, but hmm? Rogue seemed pretty confident. He said that Cyril can't match up or something like that, right? Like, uh, yeah, in the late game, he said yeah. he's the real macro zerg. So I, I mean, mean, that's yeah, that's uh, that's a big statement. I think he's wrong as hell. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to point out that this does qualify as the Artosis curse, robbing us of another Serral back-to-back BlizzCon victory. So uh, thanks, Dan. Well, we <laughs> got to make sure someone who won before wins again because we can't have too many different champions. It's really important. Um, okay. I think that's a pretty good little preview of what begins next week. I believe actually exactly. One like week almost from to today. the minute one week We're from down. today. It's or very close to the minute. Oh, wow. Like 40 minutes of, of right now. It's that almost is- as if you planned this, Artosis. Didn't plan it. Just just happens to be. All right. We have one more uh, little subject to go into, guys. Uh, kind of a sad one here. Adrian Harris has left Blizzard. Uh, for those of you who do not know who Adrian is, Adrian has been 
one of the top people in StarCraft esports for a very long time now. He he was he came over during the um, IPL acquisition. If anyone remembers that, like he used to work for IPL. Uh, IPL got bought out by Blizzard, mm -hmm. which I remember at the time everyone was like, "Huh, that's kind of weird." It doesn't seem like IPL is necessarily doing that well. But Adrian was kind of like one of the big standout stars that came over from that and rose through those StarCraft ranks rather quickly. I, I believe he was called the WCS commissioner. I never really yeah. understood uh, that particular title. I'm not really sure what that means. Like I, yeah. uh, it, I it almost seems was... like a wrestling uh, term or something. <laughs> the commissioner, he comes out and draws balls, but the he does so much more than that. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. He was basically the, the first in command for StarCraft Esports, right? At this point, like he was, uh, under Kim Pham until Kim Pham started like uh, heading multiple esports divisions instead. And then it, it was basically him that took over for the most part. So uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, big deal. Like, yeah, I think he was uh, under Mark Olberts for a bit and then had to take a bunch of that responsibility when Mark was let go and then under uh, Kim. I'm not sure if they were like, maybe they were parallel rather. I think Mark was yeah, more maybe. on the side of production. Yeah, you could be right on that. Yeah. It's I don't think Mark was as involved in esports in itself, like actually. Yeah, drafting. yeah. Well, I I think with some of the titles that people have, it's a little bit misleading when you read the title because everyone kind of does so much over there, yeah. and that's definitely something that I can vouch. Adrian like was doing everything yeah, for yeah. a very very long time. Yeah, yeah. especially well, I, the the thing about Adrian that always like really impressed uh, me was that besides being a fellow super tall white dude uh, that I always uh, uh, identified with him, he was covering. You up to him? Oh, oh, actually, I looked very eye to eye with Adrian. Oh, Thank really? You. Okay. Thank you. We're gonna like forget that one point two five inches he's got on me, but <laughs> the. Uh, is it, he was actually covering for uh, StarCraft One esports for quite a while um, a, a, as well, and he was just like the guy for everything. I remember I, I talked to Adrian at uh, I think it was GSL versus the World, I forget, but I was just like, "So what is your job?" And he's like, "Okay," so he goes over it, and then uh, because there were less people working in the uh, department after time and time, I was like, "So Adrian, who do I need to talk to about this thing?" He's like, "That's me." And I was like, "Well, yeah, but what about this other thing?" He's like, "That's me too." And I was like okay, wow, you actually just kind of do everything. Not to discount the other people that work in StarCraft Esports, but like, damn, this is like the guy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Kerry and uh, Kyle do a lot too. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, Adrian has a lot of decision-making too. You know, there's yeah. a lot of filters when it comes to Blizzard. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's a lot of voices usually for yeah. decision-making. And there's, there's still some fantastic people left that'll be filling the Adrian void. But, mm -hmm. you know, there is that kind of sad feeling that we keep seeing these people that have been around for so long that have really shaped you know the, what we what we have within starcraft that are leaving i don't know it's it's uh i guess i mean i'm happy for all these people to move on with their careers and do what they want to do you you know mm -hmm. that's that's an important aspect of life you can't just stay everywhere stay somewhere forever because artosis wants you to um <laughs> but you know it's it, there's some sort of sadness there i guess yeah I mean, there's a there's a concern to be addressed, perhaps as well, right? Like a lot of people think this is the end of uh, StarCraft esports or whatnot. Like that seemed to be a pretty prevalent sentiment in the Reddit thread, for example. Like the first most upvoted comment was something like, "We're fucked, aren't they? Like I don't think we are. I think um, I think from from what I've heard, from what I know, chances are pretty high that StarCraft esports, like backed by Blizzard, continues on um, for upcoming years. So I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be, yeah. I wouldn't be freaking out too much. I, I would also say while we're talking about um, uh, Adrian leaving, because that's like the topic, there's still like an entire StarCraft esports team. Like there's still a bunch yeah. of people working on them. I think uh, uh, Carrie LaRose, uh, I think Maynard said that in chat as well, is uh, kind of the, the guy who's like assuming a lot of this, um, the, the mantle. Um, but, uh, you know, it is still a huge loss because he just, was the guy doing this for so long so um yeah it really does hurt to see yeah Kerry's great he and he already had a lot mm -hmm. of shared responsibility i think yeah so yeah like, you know carrie has no, been doing a lot for a long time no doubt yeah. uh but yeah kind of i guess congratulations on your future adrian will be well missed within starcraft um yeah kind of a 
a down point in some ways, but happy, happy for him again. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a huge up point somewhere else. And, you know, there's no rule that says That's you true. can only like StarCraft. So for everybody else that works on or that, that likes whatever it is that Adrian works on next, that's going to be pretty badass. Yeah, that is true. Where we lose, someone else gains. All right. Uh, yeah, I guess that, that about does it for our uh, main topics on the show. And I think we're going to go ahead and jump into the Patreon questions. Uh, so let me pull those up. Just a moment, guys. Let's see here. Don't take too, I mean, take it all the time you need, Dan. I'm just staring at Katz's puppy. <laughs> I know. It's so cute. It's so cute. Okay. So as far as the Patreon questions, guys, go. Um, of course, if you want to leave a Patreon question, go to patreon.com forward slash the pylon show. Sign up. Uh, and you can leave them on the pylonshow.com. Okay. Uh, so last week, uh, there was a question about this whole uh, the Blitz Chung um, mm. uh, predicament within Hearthstone, Blizzard's reaction to that uh, within the Patreon questions. Uh, that, that was something that had broken less than 24 hours before. So I put it off to this week, and we have questions within here uh right now so let's go ahead and i want to go ahead and kind of answer these questions first we'll kind of group them together so it isn't like what's your favorite starcraft player and then another question about it so uh let me just go ahead and uh read some of these questions here and you guys can sound off however you like and uh, i'll say something as well anyways uh empty oois asks do we care more about this game or our freedom to talk about communist authoritarianism in Hong Kong? That's not a real question. Okay, <laughs> uh, but there's there's more in here that are more realistic. Uh, let me see. Um, Washburn21 asks, uh, J. Allen Brack claims in his recent non-apology that our relationships with China had no influence on our decision. Does anyone believe in this? Is there any way to make Blizzard listen to the community other than stopping all support for them? Uh, then there's another one. Arthur asks, I am attending BlizzCon and want to know what our content creators, uh, Tasteless, Artosis, Pig, Nero, recommend to show support and love of the games, but also express uh, disapproval of censorship. Is it dangerous to deprive players their voice and the opportunity to use their fame to advocate? Uh, let me see if there's any more. One second, guys. Okay, so those are those are the ones that popped up this week um, about that. Okay, so uh, just a couple things that came into my mind. So first off, I don't like to respond to something like immediately when it comes out because you generally don't have that much information. And I think that that's something that is a generally good rule that I think a lot of people might want to incorporate into their lives. Um, and it was kind of interesting when this stuff first broke, uh, there, there was two different people sending me questions. There was people that were just honestly wondering what I thought about the situation and cool. I appreciate that you like want to know what I think about a topic that's not necessarily completely related to what I do, but you know, I, you know, that's, that's cool. And then there, uh, was also a set of people sending in questions that were, just outraged and were either looking for me to join their outrage or to be outraged at me for having the wrong opinion. Mm -hmm. now, I've been on the internet for a hell of a long time and <laughs> I can read questions and sometimes know which one you are and sometimes not know which one you are. Okay. So there's, there, there can be some mystery in that, but I know that there were people from both groups uh, messaging about that. So uh, if you're only looking for outrage, uh, that's, I mean, I know that outrage is like this addictive thing for humans, but I like to try to take my time and uh, try to have uh, a more thought out opinion than just gain, you know, joining into the rage at a moment. Yeah, bandwagoning, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, like, for instance, I, I saw a lot of people uh, on Twitter where they would like, because I was like kind of following it on Twitter as it happened because it was so, it was strange to watch because people would like start out with like a tweet that was like pretty angry it's like okay 
Uh, and then like 10 minutes later, there'd be another angrier tweet where it's like, I'm done with Blizzard or whatever, uninstalling. And I saw a lot of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, okay, that's, you know, that's something that you can do. Um, the, the, I don't know. The thing that kind of confuses me about it a little bit is that like someone very high up made this choice. And, uh, you know, like someone high up at Blizzard, I guess, right, made made this choice. And when people are like, are you going to... Hearthstone Esports, I'm not sure how immediate the choice was. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know who, who it was that made it or anything or how high up it was. But the thing is, this does this reflect at all on the StarCraft team? No. Does it reflect at all on the StarCraft Esports team? No. Does it reflect at all on... Starcraft casters or Starcraft pro gamers or Starcraft streamers? No. Does it negate all the hard work that we've done over the past X years uh, to build this scene at all? No, I don't I don't think it really reflects upon any of that. So like I will not be boycotting Starcraft or anything like that. I mean, this is my livelihood and everything. Um I mean, those were those were some of my first thoughts about it. Where it's like, okay, I mean, you're you're totally allowed to have your opinions and and boycott or or do whatever, uninstall the game, not watch things. It's it's all up to you. Uh, I don't think that like unsubscribing from base trade TV is going to hurt Blizzard. I think it's only going to hurt <laughs> Rifkin, for instance, right? So, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of one of my first thoughts about some of the reactions. I guess. Do you guys have anything to? say about this uh, yeah i have a lot of things to say the first the my first reaction was well i don't follow politics i don't know what's going on really then i read more on it i started doing some research um, and the first thing that i did was to tweet um a tweet longer and trying to provide a little bit of perspective especially on those grounds right because uh, i've worked as a consultant at blizzard i've worked with multiple people at blizzard and there you know there's multiple people that are really compassionate just like good people who don't share these opinions who wouldn't make this decision and who also can't just pack up and get the fuck out because it's their li li livelihoods at stake right so it's um so it's a little bit unfair i think that was my first thought as well for people to to project their anger onto anyone affiliated with blizzard right like um as far as uh as the decision making like um blizzard is a public company right and and that means they have to answer to shareholders and we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, change I think since this has happened over the last few years um, and there has to be someone you know you know if the president won't answer to the show like I asked the question openly like what is what uh, what what do sh what do shareholders value it's it's the value of their shares right like that's what they have in common Mm -hmm. So this kind of decision is, from my perspective at least, and I speak only, you know, speculating and for myself, uh, very difficult from that angle because you're, for whatever morals you may have as an individual, even for the person making the decision or in the room, in the meeting or whatever, whatever wherever the decision happens, um, it's much easier to advocate for the tangibles of the situation, which is, from again, from my perspective, speculating, if we lose China with the investment that they've made into Diablo Immortal, which I, which it already was a big backlash, right? They already suffered from that as a company. Um, um, and if you lose the Chinese market over this, then, you know, the shareholders, your boss <laughs> is not going to be happy. Um, so from that perspective, it's much easier to agree on that, I think, than agree on your individual sets of morals, which are more intangible. Um, so for this, I would make uh, somewhat of an analogy, I guess. For example, me as a player, right? I am a, I am a very creative player, right? Like I make my own builds, I make my own strategies, I have fun with the game. Um, much of much of whatever following I have is it's due to that, not due to winning. I am a private company, right? I am cats. I make my own decisions. I can I can subscribe to my own morals and my own uh, because you know like if I want to have fun I want to make my own builds that's what I do but then all all of a sudden if I become a, a public company and I am Cat's public company and 
Twitch chat is telling me what to do. Well, they'll be more concerned with me winning because that's more tangible, right? That gives me money. If you win, you get more exposure, if, you know, like, mm -hmm. so all of these things are easier to quantify than the intangible that is, oh, I'm creative. So maybe, you know, maybe I'll get some more exposure. I'll get more highlights, right? Um, and and that, that in itself can translate into income. And I think that Blizzard has had to shift a lot of the philosophy that it was built on to accommodate for this more tangible um, gains, right? Um, and some people speculate maybe that's why why Micah went, right? There were the the layoffs, like not that uh, not that long ago. There was um, heroes being dropped, right? Like these are things that are uncharacteristic of of Blizzard as it as it was before that alienate their current fan base, but mm -hmm. as a company, perhaps pursue something bigger, right? Um, and that's just, I mean, be angry at capitalism for that as well, right? Now, there is a lot of um, arguments which I empathize with from, you know, my own perspective, uh, that this is a, an issue of human rights and freedom of, of speech and uh, and there's two groups of people, one that's angry at Blizzard and one that's actually trying to raise awareness and, and concern for the situation in Hong Kong in itself, right? And, and these two groups are holding on to the same situation for different outcomes, essentially. Um, so, I mean, I think that, and people are like, well, this isn't, this is basic human rights. This isn't politics. That's That's been echoed a lot, but but human rights are kind of politics, really. It's like, that's at the root of politics, right? It's agreements on how we can do better for each other. And freedom of speech is one of those things that is just at the very core of things because there was a human rights act at some point that 193 out of 195 countries signed, including mm -hmm. China. So it's like, I think that pretty much everyone on paper gets behind. Um, and that's why where I feel like the callouts are um, sort of warranted um, and where I think that it was uh, a mistake on the side of Blizzard to make this decision even on a financial front because ultimately it hurt them more. I think that uh, there could have been better decision making by not having a, as harsh of a punishment um, to the player and still punishing the player and setting precedent for that, you know, politics will not be tolerated without uh, repercussions. Um, all in all, you know, I support freedom of speech. Um, I don't like the response from Blizzard like most people, but at the same time, there's a lot to understand, right? Like what happens mm -hmm. if, um, if, uh, if Blizzard falls, right? Like all of, all of a sudden, if, 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 say, if, say if they don't do anything as a repercussion, then China pulls out. And then they have so much invested into Diablo Immortal. That's like the only title that's coming out or that they have announced in a long time, right? Um, and uh, and losing the Chinese market again. I won't pretend to know a lot about like what percentages look like here, like the Chinese market versus the Western audience. But I imagine it's mm -hmm. pretty fucking huge. Um, and then what does that mean for employees now at Blizzard, right? Like fuck, if you if you lose like say half of your income, maybe we're all fucked as well, right? Like mm. as far as like employees lay over like layoffs and maybe games not having the budget that they that they otherwise would to continue on supporting themselves so it's not a it's not a simple issue and it's mm. i think from the end of blizzard it's not something that would be easy to talk about or communicate without seeming insensitive um, but that's my thoughts on the matter mm. well i think that's uh very well thought out and conveyed thank you cats um yeah i think that something to mention here also uh like this happened to blizzard it could have been for instance this could have happened at riot right and then riot maybe puts their foot in their mouth or does something wrong that the community does not like and then blizzard learns from that instead it happened to blizzard now everyone else is going to learn from that and be mm -hmm. more prepared when this occurs mm -hmm. in the future this was always going to eventually happen to someone first in the big publishing esports world mm -hmm. uh so i think that that's something in in that retrospect it was like i guess you can consider it unlucky for blizzard because someone else could have eaten all that hate and then blizzard could have gotten its ducks in a row on something like this so yeah uh, not to defend but just i try to look at this in kind of a 
a more real way like you, I think cats. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult problem to tackle. I mean, it's, if you're, it's yeah, a very you're making yeah. a decision, so I don't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, me either. And I mean, there, yeah, it, there's, there's so much going on in the world. There's so many different political things and everything. I think that uh, overall uh, esports fans don't want every match to be involved with that type of thing. Right. That's, I think that that would sap a lot of the, the love out of it as well. I, so. I think so. But I think, I think a lot of people are drawing a line between, you know, like, um, like who are you going to vote for president and, and this because it's it's a little bit more core than that as far yeah, as like, human yeah. rights is concerned and shit. So like I can empathize with that as well. Totally. Like I think totally. that the call out is warranted. I think that you know, I think that the reaction is is kind of like not just what you would expect, but almost what you would want um, as a world citizen because it raises awareness about you know mm. shit that's going on. Like I've lived through an authoritarian government myself growing up in Peru. It's not. It's not. It's not awesome, you know, <laughs> like so, there was like terrorism and shit. Like I've been to, to like peaceful protests and gotten gassed and shit. So it's like uh, I've seen the videos and stuff like I can certainly empathize. And that's why a lot of Blizzard employees are also outraged, right? Like a lot of Blizzard employees are actually in, in support of of uh, Hong Kong in itself and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah. And at the same time, being on the right side of history, it's it's not as simple as, yeah, let's all fucking jump on that train right like it's like there's many examples where where that all goes wrong like the u.s was on both sides when it came to cuba for example and like mm -hmm. the revolution in cuba didn't turn out so well when fidel castro became a dictator himself and shit right it's so it's it's a complex as fuck issue <laughs> yeah but uh, but freedom of speech i think we can get behind <laughs> mm. or at least i can yeah not not sure what else to really say about the the subject uh you know yeah not i don't know i think i think you said it well and i yeah it, it just i i guess uh the the part that i wanted to convey most heavily is maybe people don't need to outrage against people who work within the blizzard sphere because yeah. they really aren't involved just... in that and uh yeah i mean they might share your values yeah yeah specific. yeah yeah everyone's in different places and stuff and anyways mm -hmm. i hope that that uh i, I mean the, the pylon show is not going to turn into a debate every patreon uh segment about this or anything like that but I but hope if that you'd that like to donate of... for a segment like that <laughs> on <laughs> patreon no no then we'll consider uh, yeah uh but yeah, I mean, I hope that that kind of lets people, I don't know. I hope that that did something for people listening that had these questions. Uh, I, I would say, as a, or... yeah, as a, as a capstone to this, not dealing specifically with this event, there's a larger issue that this highlights that is a whole lot more convicting. Uh, and that is uh, it's kind of twofold. One, uh, I saw a lot of people tweeting it at Nick and Dan, at every personality and every esport everywhere. It's like, I need to know whether I like you or hate you based <laughs> on your view of this issue. And I'm like, my dude, there's a lot of issues out there. And if you like or hate someone based on what they believe, like, I think that says a lot about you. Um, I think that the human condition is being able to hold two opposite things equal and be able to live and survive in that uh, world. And if you cannot have another person around you who has different viewpoints, and that is remarkably intolerant of you. Now, obviously, some of these viewpoints are crazy and like good and bad, whatever. I'm not judging that. I'm just saying that uh, probably if you need your StarCraft commentator, or your esports commentator, to have one specific set of political views, I don't know if you know that's that's the best way to go about it. I would say the second thing is that Twitter accounts are not people. Facebook accounts are not people. They are brands, okay? And if you like uh, the you ask any YouTuber, ask any Instagram model, like the algorithm that describe that determines what your channel gets advertised on is based on what content you put in it. And if you weaken your brand by uploading whatever, it's like, like, like some people use their, their social media accounts to be a person. And you know, if that's what your, your brand is, go for it. 
but not everybody does. And so you can't ask people to take an esports brand and then spin that and say, well, now you need to have a personal opinion about that. That's, that's not really the way it works. And I would say thirdly, um, the, the much bigger issue is that had this not happened, the viewpoint at every company would still be exactly the same way. And the fact that the that only after this issue has happened are all of these strong viewpoints coming out is really telling because obviously this specific issue has been going on far before a Hearthstone player was involved. Because in the grand scheme of things, Hearthstone is a very small part of what is a very big issue. And if that's what it takes for you to have a very strong stance on something, I think your very strong stance is due in part to a small part, not the big issue as a whole. And so I think that if you want to have your opinion and speak that vocally, don't do that because of a Hearthstone thing. Do that because it's something you believe outside of an isolated tiny event, um, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of very disingenuous uh, emotions being shared that are very either reactionary, very um, uh, bandwagon. Uh, Everything I've... is reactionary though, right? No. Like, and this raises awareness. Like for example, I wasn't aware of mm -hmm. these issues before, mm -hmm. before the thing happened. I'm in the gaming community. I don't really care about politics. Mm -hmm. This came up. I researched about it as a result. And then I formed my opinion based on that. Yeah. I don't think yeah. you can get mad at anybody based on information. And so putting that out there is obviously something I'm very happy about. I think that's probably the best outcome of all of this is that more people are more aware. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. All right. Um, thank you guys for sounding off and giving your opinions on that subject. Again, I hope that all the people asking uh, questions in the Patreon and everything, I hope that this uh, did something for your for your questions. But yeah. Uh, okay, let's let's jump into the other Patreon questions now. Uh, next one up, Sate Zero asks, Artosis, your fated play best of seven versus your alternate reality self in Brood War, who is a Protoss player. Who wins, what score, and what would Dark Artosis, Dark Tosis complain <laughs> about as a Protoss player uh, about Terran Imbalance or Tisagi? So if there was another version of me that played Protoss and studied Protoss as hard as I play and study Terran, uh, I would say as of right now, if you put the same amount of hours in, the Protoss version of me would win <laughs> probably probably three to one or oh, it's a best of seven let's call it four to one or four to two Ooh. because below like flash level uh protoss beats Terran. but yet, now um, you have to become that person you have to become dark artosis and so do you think dark artosis would actually think that he's gonna beat non-dark Artosis, or would you yeah, say? Yeah, for sure, oh. for sure, because his MMR would be a lot higher because he plays Protoss, <laughs> and he would know that he's super good. Um, yeah, yeah, no, totally. I've seen, I've seen what really intelligent, smart Protoss practice looks like. It looks like what Noni became. It's you know, uh, I'm sure that I'm sure that Dark Artosis would be a complete badass and <laughs> probably be very close again to ASL at this point. What cookies would Dark Artosis eat? Definitely not the ones that you eat. Well, chocolate ones. <laughs> you know. What cookies? <laughs> like, oh, that's a good question. It'd be dark chocolate. Yeah, yeah they would be dark chocolate oatmeal cookies. Oh, um, there we go. Still oatmeal cookies. <laughs> of course, it's the best. We went over this. Uh, okay, thank you for the question. Red Gunner Guy asks, great show. What is the cutest thing someone has said about the game? A six-year-old I showed GSL 2, once called The Tempest, a big flying electric airplane and the ultralisk a big chomping monster <laughs> what's the cutest thing you guys have seen said about starcraft <coughs> my daughter thinks that zerglings in starcraft 2 look like puppies so she would Aww. always call them puppy looking things and eventually she learned the word zergling but at first didn't say it quite right which was cute i can't remember exactly what she was saying but uh i thought that was that was pretty cute i don't think i have one for this I don't know. I think the cutest thing about StarCraft now is the Carbot mod. So yeah. that's that's pretty that's pretty cute. It's pretty cute. All right. Uh, sorry, Red Gunner guy. Turns out that these guys don't have children, so can't really answer <laughs> your question as well as I can. Yeah. But it would be puppies. The Zerglings being puppies for me. I think that's pretty funny. No, no, um, 
also also it's very cute when she tries to decide who's winning when she's like a, a lot of times in the morning like if uh challenger is on or something in na it's normally on as i'm feeding them breakfast so i'll just have it on the tv and she'll look and try to tell me who she thinks is winning and stuff and it's normally like if she sees a lot of stuff for someone so she's i mean it's pretty smart yeah she comes pretty close all right thank you for the question uh also uh b between questions yeah. want to give a huge shout out to cobra venom who is the best guy in photoshop ever for having somehow found a way to cut <laughs> out Katz's puppy and that was put it on your shoulder. Actually, oh, it was Alessander. <laughs> okay. I just threw it on screen. Okay. Amazing. Well, a big thanks to Alessander for making our lives a little bit better. So cute. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sauce King asks Every time I ask an SC2 question, I ask it to Broodwar people. Not this time, I hope. <laughs> So again, <laughs> you could fuse any two StarCraft II pro gamers together to make the ultimate StarCraft II banjo. Who would you combine? Uh, what race would they play, and why would they be the ultimate banjo? Mm -hmm. Well, it would have to be Hey Pro and probably his dark self, right? The original banjo. I would. I mean, I've kind of talked about it before, where I feel like uh, if you mixed in Haas's play with Stats play. How dangerous would that be if, like, one in five time games, Stats just did one of Haas's ridiculous all-in builds and just went, you know, balls to the wall with it? I've always felt like that type of randomization added into the ridiculous, awesome defensive play of Stats would be really, really good. Um, maybe it, now there's someone else that we could... Like, maybe it would be parting in Stats now instead, as parting is... You know, I think Parting's uh, control is maybe a little bit better than Stats, and he does a lot of uh, Haas's aggressive builds, but I think he's refined them a bit better, so maybe I'll go with Parting and Stats. Um, so Protoss is your answer as well. <laughs> well, it would be those are the two players I can put together easily. I think it's easier mm -hmm. to answer with Protoss because it's a more stylistic race, mm -hmm. where it's like, who do you combine with Serral? Like, I combine cats with Cyril. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you. Cyril wow, doing that, that Evo block. If he did that at the BlizzCon finals, we would freak out. Those oh yeah, hundred percent. Freak out. That yeah, that think, would. Uh, yeah, I think I think you're looking at the right uh, combinations as far as approaches. I think that the two main approaches to StarCraft are going to be like iteration and then exploration, basically. And people who iterate have stronger mechanics, and people who explore kind of have a wider range of knowledge because they play with everything um but they tend to not be as good with anything so uh yeah a combination like that i think that uh, mm -hmm. there are very few terran players that are thinking and like have strong mechanics so maybe i would fuse like you know like gumiho with like maru or soul or mm. you know, yeah. or maybe even ty with one of those or something like that I think if you just think about like the different kinds of players there are, maybe you want there to be like a brain kind of player, or a micro macro, whatever kind of player. Um, I think about like each player that exemplifies each one of those kind of characteristics um, and people are like aggressive defensive. Maybe you think of like stats as a defensive player. Beyond is a micro player, like whatever, probably each one of the archetypes uh, from them. Uh, but I would say that regardless, the race that this fusion uh, of players would be would have to be Zerg. There's a very important reason for that, because when it comes to banjos, there's two main ways that you play a banjo. There's a right handed strumming technique, which is called a roll. And that's what you see, what you listen to when you listen to like traditional country banjo music. But the other way is a more staccato technique when you pluck the strings, and that is called a drone. So, there you go. <laughs> wow. Nice. Did you... Why do you know these things? Well, I've played many instruments for many years, Artosis. But in the last five minutes, I read the Wikipedia article. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm well-educated, except actually I just looked it up. Uh, all right. Thank oh, you for the question. Nesty, nesty would be good to fuse with someone, actually. There you go. Nesty and then someone with modern mechanics. Yeah, Nesty. Yeah, Nesty was so brilliant. I think, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he was even like so good in, or he was a B teamer in Brood War, but all the players talked him up for being one of the smartest. He just couldn't keep up. And then StarCraft 2 comes out and then, you know, resets the field of mechanics. And then he was a god for as long as yeah, he could keep yeah, up. That's very true. 
Yeah. There's also that kind of thing that I'm always really fascinated in is that he was a two versus two player. And mm-hmm. I really think that uh, focusing on the very basics of StarCraft, like at the beginning, and the thing is, you never really tech that high, so nothing gets too complicated. But if you become a master of early game, uh, like usage of units, I guess, it's kind of, it, the thing is, you're getting a ton of information in Tubers too, watching the units clash all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it, the thing is, he's not the only best Zerg player ever that was a two versus two player. There was another that cannot be named that was actually a two versus two player before he became the only bone we ever had for Zerg in StarCraft 1. So it's when I see that, I don't know, it's just something that always pops in my mind that like, huh, there's something there about really grinding out some of these basic things that are going to give you a good platform to become. Well, 2v2 is very strategical and yeah. mechanics are like, a, take, yeah. take a, a backseat to that, right? It's about coordination and it's about strategy and making sense of two you know, you're fusing two races a lot of the time or two approaches at least to become one. So there's, it's more complexity, mm. but uh, yeah. 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 All right. Cool question. Thank you much. Yeah. Uh, Inescu asks, isn't the worst imbalance in StarCraft II the fact that Zerg can't upgrade buildings late game? Terran has two building upgrades and Protoss buildings benefit from shield upgrades. How about a hive tech upgrade, which speeds building health regen? And don't say build more layers, that's too expensive. <laughs> I don't think that that's the biggest imbalance. What do you think, Katz? Um, I don't know about the biggest imbalance, but I think there's something to the idea in that I think that a lot of the problems in terms of design is that Zerg has to turtle so much, and it, it carries over to that Brute Lord Infestor compositions mm. that everyone hates or like Swarm Host in the past, and that all has to do with the creep mechanics as well but also with the fact that the Roach and the Hydra don't really scale up. Um, like Lynx kind of scale up, Ultralisks in, in CVT they can be okay, and CVP they're unusable because the Immortal exists. So like ground-based compositions or like non-spellcaster compositions are pretty much impossible to win a fight with. Mm-hmm. Um, so if there was more scaling for those, then you could easy, more easily, I think, downscale on the other aspects and then yeah. have a more broody, aggressive Zerg, I think. So I would love to see more like a plus four, plus four, plus four upgrades for Hydra uh, Road and downscale and Brute Lord Infestor type shit. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's I like the idea. Yeah, um, yeah. tell the about it. <laughs> I was just gonna say it's really hard. Like the whenever you talk about adding or subtracting, uh, especially upgrades, like that really throws everything uh, out of whack. Shield upgrades, for example, uh, like I cannot imagine how finely tuned those are because it is something that affects, like you said, the, the whole Protoss race. Uh, for example, in Brood War, shields take full damage, uh, whereas like the actual HP bar takes damage based on the unit type. And so like there's lots of complicated things like that. I would say that for, for Zerg specifically, um, the idea of adding in like a, a regen upgrade doesn't, I don't think that really fixes the problem that Katz was talking about, which is the scalability of the units. Uh, I don't know if building health and adding that regen would be commensurate yeah, with that. So I don't think that those are equal the way that you're comparing them. But I, I mean, it's you're you're hitting on an an issue that exists. I just don't know if that's the way. Uh, you know, I've I've said it many times. I think cats like to your point that roaches and hydras don't scale into the late game. The reason why these why base units don't scale into the late game is because spellcasters are so strong in the late game. Mm-hmm. So I. I feel like uh, whenever anyone's looking at that and like why you must mass spellcasters is because they're the strongest thing. So I really think that that's why we have a hard time. Yeah, Yeah, it's like size storm. And there's more units, then you're hitting more units with your AOE. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, it just gets more and more valuable. And the thing is, the later in the game, you can afford more of the spellcasters so that you just don't really run out of spells. And they're very easy to use as well. So you can really punish anyone going for base units. Mm-hmm. Yeah. which kind of forces these weird scaling situations where everyone is forced into mass spellcaster. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there's I'll probably there's be shouting amount, into the so. abyss about that forever, but yeah. 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 There. I think the biggest thing that somebody uh, said was, you know, certainly the uh, rapid fire hotkey usage is a kind of a iconic way to nerf that idea. But mm. um, Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm just a big believer in the brood war. You have to click something to use it uh, mentality. 
So if you really want to cast eight storms from selecting eight high Templar, go for it. But obviously that's pretty harsh. Hmm. Yeah, and it's a different game. It's less intuitive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you for the question. Some Drunk Canadian asks, you are the lead SC2 developer and have been hanging around some drunk Canadian too much and are now sufficiently drunk. You decide you want to make the game as imbalanced as possible. What unit do you move from one race to another? Fungal storm, anyone? Sending much love from the drunk north. How would you make the game the most imbalanced by moving one unit to another race? I would get Marines on Zerg. Yeah. yeah, that's actually the very first thing that came to mind for me. Yeah. Or I think just the stim upgrade to any race. <laughs> that would be. What, yeah, that would that would do it. Uh, what no about medevacs, though? Give Protoss banelings. <laughs> that would be pretty good too. So they could just have more splash damage faster. Um, yeah, I think anytime you change one of the early units, like that's that's always like very iconic. So if you added like you know the adrenal upgrade, you know you could say to something. Uh, I don't know units like. Maybe the mothership is a pretty polarizing unit, but also, yeah, I think you'd have to go with like something like Stim. Yeah, give, yeah. give Zerg Marines and watch it never lose another game. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Or All just right, remove one of the legs from the Colossus. <laughs> Meh, meh. Uh, all right, thank you for the question, some drunk Canadian. Nahyan asks, uh, how did you guys meet each other for the first time? Uh, first time I met Rapid, I remember clearly it was the IESF tournament. Yeah, we were Korea. casting Hearthstone together. That's right. He he was flown over to cast some Hearthstone, and I was casting Hearthstone, so we casted together. And I actually was like, "Wow, this yeah. guy's actually a pretty good caster." I, so, I made uh, a, a really stupid paladin joke, and Artosis laughed and laughed. And afterwards, he was like, "You know, you're all right." I'm like, "Thanks, Artosis." Yeah, yeah. So that's that's when I met Rapid. Uh, for as far as cats, I'm sure it was on Brood War playing one versus ones we had to have played but when did you meet him so probably, probably MLG, MLG. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah it's weird yeah. like like it yeah. would be an mlg yeah <laughs> like uh yeah like because we've known each other but not really known known yeah. each other for so long it's very difficult mm -hmm. to discern when that exactly happened but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but yeah i'm sure we played a starcraft game together mm -hmm. it has to be like 2000 oh, yeah, sure. or something i don't know I, I guess the first time I met Katz was uh, at IHOP at BlizzCon last year. That was <laughs> yeah, that was really... wearing that uh, that suit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah great. <laughs> that was that was an iconic moment for sure. <laughs> I think you we were at me. IHOP until like two a.m. or something. It was it was a good time. Yeah, Katz played a uh, Zerg in StarCraft One as well. All right, thank you for the question Trenkal asks in the past i spent a lot of time playing rts games like age of empires 2 outlive rivals realm etc while some of them might feel like clones of other rts games i still had fun playing them what are your favorite rts games other than starcraft warcraft 3 <laughs> oh come on that's the cop out answer <laughs> that's that's actually not my answer at all though like oh, really? there's actually been some other games that i really liked i actually yeah. do think that tooth and tail was a mm -hmm. great game it is a great game it's just not really played but i think that that's like uh, a very interesting and neat game even though it's like very simple comparatively uh, i watched you play it a bit i hate yeah. like really bad graphics for some reason i can't oh yeah, that's a pixel art that's like my childhood that's what i want i want like 16 <laughs> yeah. bit uh I, I really liked during the beta phase before they ruined it due to the feedback of people playing in the beta phase, the Armies of Exego was a ridiculously good game. It oh. was the closest to StarCraft ever made, I would say. Um, uh, yeah, he mentions Outlive in there. I actually thought Outlive was like a, a really cool like pre predecessor to, to StarCraft. I don't think it was actually like predecessor. I think it came out in like like a couple years after StarCraft. Uh, but Outlive was fantastic RTS back in the day. It just didn't mm. work as well as like clunkier than StarCraft was. Yeah. I th I think um, Age of Empires three was very very good, uh, but very hard to balance. Yeah, and it just it didn't pick up quite enough steam. I think. Well, but I think that was a very good game for. Yeah, uh, every other yeah. RTS just feels really clunky, like clicking stuff and microing mm. stuff. And, yeah, like, that's uh, yeah, that's yeah. Where I can't the yeah. other RTSs. Like Warcraft 3 comes closest to the experience, but the StarCraft 2 engine is just better. 
I just wish yeah. Someone, yeah. someone made a an RTS yeah. that was as re responsive at the very yeah. least. I think my That's favorite they go wrong. Oh, I was just gonna say I think my favorite other RTSs are ones that add different like components because like when you think about brood war you think about uh like how difficult it is to move stuff and that's like a really iconic part of that or when you think about starcraft 2 you think about like you know how slick it is to just like do everything and move stuff around and maybe the more strategic you know atmosphere that that brings um but the other two rts's that i play that really were my gateways into starcraft were uh homeworld which is a relic rts if you've never played that the single player is almost more impressive than the multiplayer but the multiplayer is really cool because it it has almost clone races but with uh, a couple of like really like deep differences on both sides like um and it also has like i think three four different uh, iterations as well as a homeworld like uh, isomorphic rts called the um, uh, deserts of karak which is okay but you know not starcraft or whatever and then the big one is dawn of war which is the warhammer 40k rts uh the first iteration not dawn of war 2 or 3 subsequently mm -hmm. just the first dawn of war so fantastic because it has individual unit squad upgrades which is almost totally unique to rts's uh at least uh because because it gives you the opportunity to make two different squads of say like marines or whatever and then have one be good against this thing and one be good against the other thing so that all races have unique ways that they can adapt and i think that that really captures the tabletop gameplay of warhammer in an rts setting and oh by the way it's rts um so i think that's the closest i've come to ever just like really having a ton of fun playing another rts yeah i, I like dawn of war one that was quite a good game i thought yeah um and actually a, a bit of a shout out to uh the game war party that came out earlier this year i didn't oh, yeah. really have much time to play it much and i kind of mm -hmm. regret that because for the time I did play it, it seemed like it actually had uh, quite a bit of potential. Like the control felt pretty good and the economy felt pretty large Which and complicated. One? War Party? War Party? Yeah, it's a dinosaur yeah. RTS. Oh, I think I saw you I saw you play that one too. Yeah, so, yeah. I didn't get RTS to play it come out. I just like, yeah, I just watched your stream. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that one, that one seemed quite it like it had a, yeah. So, yeah. Wow. So, Somebody... Somebody reminded me in, in chat, my first RTS that I played was Age of Empires, but the one I probably played the most growing up was Lords of the Realm 2. If anybody played that, that was a fantastic old RTS. Hmm. I'm dating myself with that one. I think that was 1994, hmm. 96. Yeah. You know, I, I Tiberian Sun was the first one I played, I think. I liked it as well. What was? Tiberian Sun. Ooh. Or maybe not the first, but the first, the first one yeah. I played a lot. Yeah. I never really played Command and Conquers. My brother, my younger brother, played Command and Conquers all the time. I watched him play a lot, but I think for me, I need units to be very microable, and I need the economy to be big. Like that's, I think that's the problem that I have with Warcraft Three. While I recognize it's like a good game and probably the third best RTS ever, it's still the economy is like. I look at that. I'm like, <laughs> it's just, it's not. <laughs> I, I like a big I want it to be like oh do you want to like have five bases or like you could play one base but there's actually choice there and like you need more yeah. than five workers like that's <laughs> that's important yeah. for me personally I, I kind of like I kind of like that approach if you're trying to make the game more casual like more accessible I think you know you have to cut somewhere um, micro seems a little bit more fun than economy but I'm with you I mean I'd rather have the whole thing just yeah. more choices all over the place. Well, yeah, no, I like to I like to have the choices so you can actually decide. You can be a mac macro player, or you can be a micro player. It's not like, oh, are you macroing well? You get less money now. Get out of here. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for the question, uh, Trinkle. Uh, Hyper Turtle asks, what are some of the big things you were certain you understood about how StarCraft II or Brood War worked that it turned out you were completely wrong about? Um, well, I guess if you look, go back far enough, everything, because <laughs> like, I mean, I've played StarCraft forever and I like every few months, I feel like all previous versions of me were pretty stupid. Like I just, <laughs> I, I'm always, always like learning more and updating my mental models on everything. And, um, I'll try to think of something more specific, but hold on. You guys have anything for that? 
Mm. I mean, I, I think anytime you go back and watch old players who are good at the game play, you realize they're actually the worst players. Like maybe they make intelligent decisions, but even a lot of the best players from like, you know, the Wings of Liberty or like the, you look at the, like the GSL open seasons, like way, way, way back in the day. Um, like every single one of those players played absolutely horribly um, by, by current standards, which is kind of expectable. Um, I don't think there's anything that anybody's like really trashed on that was super broken. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I actually heard Dan make that same argument on the GSL that like new players are mm. wor more worthy of commendation type thing or like the current players. But, uh, but I think it's different skill sets that you're looking at because yeah. when the game is new, what you need is to be able to explore and to be able to like figure it out by yourself essentially and to be able to come up with things that work and strategies and counters and, and all of these things become more and more obsolete as the game ages and then iteration takes over uh with a much you know much stronger where there's like more well instituted philosophies of, of you know how the game can be played and many think how the game should be played they go as far as as to say right and uh but that, that makes it so that they are so good at executing these things that they can, you do it over and over and then you're focusing and zooming in on the smaller and smaller details because the more you do something, mm -hmm. the less you have to think about it and the less you have to think about it, the more it's automated and the faster it happens. So, so of course, yeah, if you compare GSL season one to GSL now, it's fucking laughable, right? But, but they're different, yeah. different. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think they're equally commendable. Yeah. Uh, they were uh, the best. They're definitely very different. Um, I guess for for me personally, I look at more modern players, and it's like, yeah, there's like a lot of talent in the early players, but it, it the further you get along, the more hard work is involved. Yeah. And I think that that I guess that's just something that I value very highly is people willing to put in long lots of effort over time to achieve their skills mm -hmm. as opposed to some players where it's like well you're just very brilliant and talented so that's like cool that you're so good at the beginning you know yeah but there's i mean yeah even even there it's like hard to measure like where um there's people who are like more or less practical for for example but like less practical people might spend more time thinking and that's uh, that's an intangible compared to just grinding right yeah so it's a difficult thing to pinpoint. I no, think. certainly, certainly. And uh, I guess something came to mind, something I was certain I understood. Well, I, I'm never really too certain on anything, but uh, what blows my mind as I'm playing uh, more competitively in StarCraft 1 right now is just how complicated the economy is. Hmm. Like, the more, like, how much you can break down, like, building SCVs and depots at different times and, like, how many per base at certain moments in the game and how unbelievably this alters the amount of minerals you have. I know can really kind of brought this up lately where he was testing out like transferring seven SCVs versus eight SCVs and how at, at seven minutes, this changes your mineral count by 300 minerals. It's like- The brood war economy was oh, awesome. I, yeah. The brood war economy yeah. is more complex than, it, it's insane how complex it is. And that's, I continue to be surprised as I get better yeah. at it, the difference that it makes. Yeah. Um, I, that's why not the StarCraft II cast or Maynard, but the reason like we say Maynarding workers is because when that guy figured out that it was insanely, it was so, so, so much better to move your workers. That was just like a concept nobody had really thought about or at least like optimized. Um, and I think obviously, I think the newer techniques are things like what's called mineral boosting, which is where you get your worker to mine just a little bit more quickly on certain patches. Um, that's something that has like the most subtle like look appearance on the screen, but actually does exponentially increase your well, that's not my correct usage of the mathematical term, but it greatly increases your your mining right off the bat. And that's uh, something that's very small that has a huge impact. I, I will it, say quickly on that topic, though, I, I really don't like it when things are unintuitive or like they don't yeah. make sense. And you have to kind of learn it from someone else who's like yeah. stumbled on, upon it type thing. Like I, like that is one thing that I like about StarCraft 2 better. Um mm -hmm. Compared to Brood War, where I think you have to learn a lot of tricks and like like look and find tricks that are not intuitive that you can't figure out on your own that you kind of just have to find through, you know, digging 
on on like the encyclopedias built on the game, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I, I like Brood War Economy just generally speaking a lot better. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thank you for the question. A good one. Uh, our very own Alessander asks, what players, Brood War and StarCraft 2, would make good announcer packs for their game? <coughs> players, guys. I think Larva. Larva. Starcraft Larva. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were both going to say that one. Yeah, StarCraft 2, no. who do we have that's a really... I would oh, I would pay big money for a big Gabe announcer pack. Yes, <laughs> I don't know about that. that would be fantastic. I think that would be good to uh, to ride the the big Gabe hype mm-hmm. memes. Ah, uh, that would be a, a clever decision. Yeah, I think I, Jim I, Canning I, would do good. Oh yeah. Oh the, yeah. The chat's saying parting as well. Another great one. Oh, parting <laughs> would be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could definitely put some no GG lines in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I would love to see a Juanito announcer pack <laughs> where like anytime any unit dies, like what the fuck, man, it'd be amazing. <laughs> I would love that. Um, yeah. Starcraft two. Uh, there used to be this be, uh, broadcaster named terror uh, who I think he, I don't know something. He, he kind of not as popular now as he used to be, but he used to be super crazy and loud and stuff. And there's tons of like lesser known, like pro players for brood war that are just like popular streamers that, are also like do crazy antics and stuff that'd be a lot of fun hmm. cool uh gg e-mini asks is there any player at blizzcon that you're really rooting for to do well <laughs> not necessarily who you think will win but a personal favorite uh i mean i'm always uh, a big rogue fan although i i think he's actually had a really decent shot to win it so i'm not that's not like a any big one to mention uh i Personally, like always, want special to do well. I've just known him forever and like him, uh-huh. so I, I would like for him to do very well at this tournament, get out of his group, and make a run again. Yeah, I would echo that on special. Uh, and as far as like, if you like hard workers, special is probably the hardest working person yeah. ever. Not Very a much. yeah. He is. He he's the the first person always to like book my computer my extra computer for blizzcon like with like he booked it like three months in advance he was like hey if i qualify i'm coming to practice okay because they don't up his, they don't open the practice area for two days like, yeah okay fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah, yeah he's yeah he he's always uh he's always special um and rainer i've been rooting for since you know since i saw him play really like when he was like low gm this little kid and he's just yeah brilliant decision making i always thought he would make it very far so i would love to see him do well and also you now uh, both rainer and the laser uh kind of have a computer reserved since i have two but if they all three make it then yeah one is not gonna have a computer for practicing <laughs> <laughs> you have to fight for it yeah they, i mean one of them will lose probably i'm not sure yeah all right cool uh thank you for your question e uh, Ravi Parikh, aka Fear Dragon, asks if you could take back all the MMR you your lost from one strategy in StarCraft II or Brood War, what would it be? Thanks, large frozen ice cream tub in the fridge. P.S. If I pledge one thousand dollars to Taste Podcast, can I talk to Tasteless every month about the China Hong Kong drama? You have to ask him on that. <laughs> Probably though. That was a combination of some Probably, nice yeah. memes there, my dude. Yeah. Uh, so if you could take back all the MMR you lost in one strategy in either game, Ooh. what would that be? I think Dark Templar his, his, hits both games, so, so I, <laughs> I'll go with that. Oh, lost from... I, I assumed it was from, like, the person beating you with the strat. Oh. I mean, you no, no, you no. losing, you losing. With, yeah. So let's do it both ways. What strategy have you done a lot that just hasn't won a lot? And then what strategy has done you in a lot? Oh, Ooh. okay. Um, geez, uh, I uh, make a lot of strategies and I experiment a lot. So a lot of them just go really bad, you know? Yeah, it's like, yeah. This is not, this is not the one. Most, most recently, the one that's lost me most games in uh, CVT is my three Ravager rush. Like there is just a response that just beats it. And I'm like, okay, well, this strategy is bad, but you guys voted for it in chat. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say that. I think for my own strategy, like practicing um, 
just flashes like two one max timing push at like 12 minutes 10 seconds like uh-huh. You have to, if you don't destroy with that build, you lose so badly. I have lost so much MMR getting good at that build. It's insane. Uh, and as far as things killing me, it's probably like Arbiter Rush. If I could get back all the points that I've lost to two base Arbiter, I'd become better against it now. But that was that was a sticking point for me for like a year. I couldn't beat it. And so I would probably have been number one on the ladder if you could give me a back all that MMR at once. <laughs> <laughs> LZ Gamer says, Artosis better say Ultralisk. That was a sticking point for a while too, but I finally figured out how to defeat it. So I don't know, man. I watched some of your games versus Hawk and mm. uh, those Ultra Boys. He has a new Ultra build that's pretty, pretty dirty. <laughs> he LZ Gamer saying- me too with one of the bases. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> took nice. my fourth i'm like what <laughs> i uh i would say when i first started playing uh wings of liberty like when it first came out and i walked back from buying my copy at gamestop to install it on my two fps hp laptop uh i was really big fan of the release uh like i think you just go like three racks like marine marauder rush and i got to plat with that and i was like when i f- came back to starcraft because i kind of skipped uh like or uh, i kind of skipped um heart of the swarm when I came back, I was just like, I wonder if this strat still, it doesn't work. But I tried to make it work for a while. And then I did a whole lot of like one base, two starport cloak banshee rushes that didn't uh, didn't work too well for me either. So either one of those is right on top. Cool. All right. Um, looks like we have one more question here from Wurzag. He asks, uh, starting, started watching more and more Warcraft 3 and highly awaiting the remastered. I started thinking about in Starcraft 3, would you like to see only the three races or would you like to see a fourth race, regardless of the known balance issue? Balance wine always everywhere anyway. What do you guys think? If Starcraft 3 were to come out, would you prefer to have four races or three races? I'm always for diversity and chaos. If you can have 10 races and have it mildly be... Yeah, balanced and I'm for that. That's one of the reasons I really liked uh, the first Dawn of War game is they literally had like I think it was like nine or fourteen races, something huge, like an astronomical number of races, and it was not extremely balanced, but it was like kind of that idea where it's so unbalanced it's balanced. If you get that idea, mm-hmm. um, so I, I think tons of races are, are are great. I think I uh, StarCraft is the iconic three race game, so I feel like you're losing a little bit of the the StarCraft magic there. I think it makes a lot of sense to make a new game and add a new race that's sort of the, hey, it's new and here's why kind of gotcha uh, thing. Either that or just like overhaul like all the units. Um, I don't know. I like StarCraft as just a three race game. Yeah, me as well. I, it's, it, I mean, it says regardless of the known balance issue, the thing is that is the issue. You can't, yeah. <laughs> the more races you have, the harder it is to balance. I've played games yeah. that have like 10 races and it's just, you get down to one or two so quickly, and then one has an edge over the other, and suddenly you're like, well, does this game have 10 mm-hmm. races or does it have one race? You know, and that's yeah, but I think if there's, a, a if there's like if there's a business model that supports you know a team that's willing to change the game over and over again, mm-hmm. you know, if if it the balance is reset yeah. like like every half a year, then that you know by the time someone figures yeah. out like this is completely broken it's yeah it's mm-hmm. changing so yeah mm-hmm. I, I would say that any game that comes out in the future is not going to have the brood war balance model where you just let it let's see uh, it's going to yeah. have a very frequent patch cycle most likely and so that actually might make it better to have more races because there's more that, you need an economical model to match though right like something it's very true support the, yeah, yeah. the team making more content and... yeah well i mean we're we're kind of off uh far afield but yeah essentially i think it would be cool to see new stuff our toast is stuck in his old ways that's true that's true <laughs> i like my stuff as balanced as possible let the best player win <laughs> how dare uh, you all right well thank you everyone for the uh patreon questions a big shout out to astrofin and mannered our 100 dollar tier uh subscribers of course big thanks to everyone who supports us on patreon Check us out on patreon.com forward slash the pylon show. Uh, of course, also check out the pylon show.com. Big shout out to our pylon show staff. I mean, without them, the show just does not occur. So, thank you to everyone who helps out. 
And uh, of course, check out matrino.com forward slash the pylon show. The code this week is cookie. Type it in. <laughs> it's important. Uh, okay. So that pretty much does it. Let's uh, say goodbye to these guests and make sure you stay tuned. We have some clips and this week in StarCraft is going to scroll through here at the end. It's been a great episode. We already said goodbye to Grant Davies earlier on. Seems like two episodes ago that we talked to him because this has been such a great one. But uh, here we are. Rapid, why don't you tell us what are you up to? Where can people find more of you? Uh, well, I will say there's a potential of finding of seeing a lot more of me uh, in the near future. But as far as uh, some cool things that are coming up, uh, I you can always find out anything that I'm doing on social media. It's uh, Twitter uh, and uh, Instagram, I think, are the ones I update most frequently. Uh, I did just upload the videos of the Corrupted Cup, which is where I where you could have been finding me uh, and I'll be putting up uh, more highlights from Corrupted Cup uh, in the, the near future on my YouTube channel. So that's youtube.com slash C slash rapid casting. Um, and then, yeah, probably just uh, Twitter. KSL is coming up, so that's going to be really exciting. So you can uh, make sure to tune in uh, to, to that as well. And yeah, just, just watch more StarCraft. Hopefully, as long as you do that, I'll be somewhere in there. Cool. And cats, how about you? What do you got? Uh, going you can on? follow me on Twitter at Red Cats. Uh, uh, you can check out my stream, uh, twitch.tv slash Red Cats. I've been trying to work on that a little bit. Um, trying to grow my brand a little bit more on my Discord as well. So you can type exclamation mark Discord when you visit my stream and then join that community as well. Um, I did some casting for Challenger last year. I'd love to do more of that next year. I'll be at BlizzCon for anyone that wants to say hi. And uh, yeah, follow and support my team as well at root for root on Twitter and our website, root4root.com. We just had two players announced. So yeah, I think that's about it. Cool. And uh, as for me, thank you guys for coming on. It was a very fun episode. A lot of good yeah, sure stuff is. to talk about. Uh, for the Pilot Show, we'll be back next week. I think we're going to have to do a slightly different time because the pre-week is starting. Artosis, and, uh, be quiet. You're making yeah. a dog angry. Uh, the The next few weeks are going to be a little bit hectic as far as streaming goes, uh, just because, you know, the, all the BlizzCon stuff coming up. Um, but, yeah, thank you, everyone, for watching. And the Pylon Show will be back next week. We'll see you then. Shout out to the Pylon Thanks Show, the greatest you. show on the internet. Thanks.
Hang on, guys, get it out of audio. There we go. Flair, the beauty of the United States of America, or as you correctly call it, the United States of Freedom, is that you don't have to be from the United States of America to be appreciated even as an American. All you have to do is have pride in this beautiful country. Treat others the way Jesus would want them to be treated. That's what this country is all about. You are the greatest I'm human! I'm so good! Oh, that was your first try! I, what can I say? Oh my what can god! I say? Dude, no, listen. The amount of games I've observed like this is like thousands, okay? I've done that like five times. <laughs> like five times I've killed all what, my What can I say, Artos? I mean, sometimes you got it. Oh sometimes my god! You, you want to clip that one? Oh my Pick god! Okay. Alright, anyway. So besides being the best, we also have to cast... These guys playing each other. And, I mean, that's going to, if he starts his third, yeah, look at this. He's got more SCDs on gas again already. So he is absolutely getting aggressive. I love it. He's also blocking the ramp, but he doesn't have an SCV right here. So that's going to mean that the Zealot oh! is Look at that control. Oh! He barely catches one of the Marines. The third Marine glitches out. Oh, my God. If he gets the last, last hit on the Marine, it's so low. Gets in between, but the Zealot and the Probe are in the mineral line. Probe's taking a lot of damage, but if he can kill off this Zealot and the Probe, that would be masterful, and he does it. Oh, my God. Now, that is micro on both sides. That was sick, sick, sick micro on both sides. Oh, my God. I, when this Marine glitched right here, I was like, oh, he's losing too much. Okay, okay, look at this. The bunker, I don't think he's actually going to make Observer. Oh, Tamaki knows that the Arbiter is going to be coming in. Look at this. He's scanning for the Arbiter. He sees it. The vessel is going to go in for an EMP. Let's see if he can hit it. The Arbiter trying to get away. EMP, EMP, can he get it? This is going to be so, so big. Trying to juke away from the EMP. And the Wraith is actually coming in here. This is not often. Oh, he misses. He misses the EMP. The Arbiter is going to be able to recall on top of the factories. But this is a ton of units. Oh, that was a Bermuda recall. Not fully, but he doesn't get that many units in. But to be honest... That maybe worked out better for him because he didn't lose a huge army. What a weird recall. All that juking for that, but you know what? Uh okay, 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 okay. Does he have siege mode on the way? Check. No, no siege mode, no siege mode. Okay. Oh, you got a micro like a madman. But you got Polish lag. Can you do it? Okay, he's got a repair. Oh, oh the take back. Mutus diving on it. The Goliaths are too busy with the Hydras. Oh, he's got the repair on the tank. What? Oh, God, he's, he repaired the tank in time. Holy cow, Kogan. What? 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 Is that the stupid what? thing?
Oh my god, I fuck it up. I fucked it up. I moved him. <laughs> this is just the best day ever. That's so fucking amazing. He's probably so lost. How often do you yell GG for sub replays? Uh, when I'm really hyped. I don't. Uh, I don't fake hype, unfortunately. I, uh, there are. There has been a couple occasions, not very often, but there has been a couple occasions where people have like showed up to my chat, or someone's a subscriber or being gifted a sub. It's usually a gifted sub because they didn't put any of their own money on the line, and they're like, Maynard, please cast this like it's round of eight of BlizzCon. And. Uh, like, hey man, I'm hyped for the round of Ada BlizzCon because it's the round of Ada BlizzCon, not the other way around. You know, you got you got to you got to preheat my hype oven. You can't just you can't just stick in that game. You need to preheat that oven. I need to, I need to be I need to be warmed up. I need I need some tournament tournament foreplay to get excited. How often do you yell GG? Thanks for watching, guys. See you next week.